Hello, everybody, and welcome to Up North and Personal, where I speak with Canadian talent and hear their stories. Our guest today, his career goes as far back as the early 80s, and in terms of his work, you know, it'd be easier to say what he hasn't done. Animating, sound editing, writing, directing, puppetry, and he even made a show you might have heard about that delved into stories some might call a bit freaky. Yeah, true story. Happened to a friend of a friend of mine, and it is an honor to speak with that friend of a friend today, Mr. Steve Schneer. Hey, you said my last name right. That's great, Malik. <laughs> oh, I'm glad I did. Points, baby. All right. Ah, <laughs> oh, well, yeah. Like I said earlier, it is an honor to speak with you. Uh, thanks for lowering your standards to speak with me today, but <laughs> admittedly low as they may be, yeah. <laughs> I like that. I like that. But uh, let's start with, you know, the customary stuff. Let's get that out of the way first. So uh, so where does your story as a creative begin? Where, where does it begin? Uh, what were the things that got you saying, you know what, I'm going to create stuff? And what were some of your biggest inspirations? Right. So it all began in about 1972. I was in my junior high school library. At the time, I was going to be an undersea explorer, like Jacques Cousteau. <laughs> uh, the fact that I couldn't swim had nothing to do with it. But uh, I had this book on sunken treasure that I must have checked out of the library 300 times. And as I'm reaching for my book on sunken treasure, there's this big book. And it's open to a picture of King Kong holding Fay Ray from the original 1933 movie. Mm-hmm. I look at the picture, and my first thought was, that's fake. And the second <laughs> thought was, how did they do that? Right, and I stopped, you know. How do they do that? I'd never seen the movie. I wasn't into movies or anything. Yeah. And I put the, the Undersea Treasure book back, and I picked up this book. It was called 50 Classic Films, The Stuff That Dreams Are Made Of. Mm-hmm. And I checked it out of the library and I read it, you know, and I, how did they do that? You know, and then you, you look, you didn't have to look close. You could see the matte lines, you know, you could see the, the shoddy special effects work. It was like three guys in 1933 making this up as they're going. Yeah. So they're inventing all this stuff. And, um, I got interested and then I borrowed, uh, a super eight camera, and my buddies and I made some plasticine movies, you know, like little stop motion guys, one frame at a time. And there were a bunch of us all through junior high school and high school. And we were doing all these little stupid student movies. And then high school, um, you know, I was going to science fiction conventions. And OK, you were talking about earlier that. You got your shirt at a, at a science fiction convention. Yeah, yeah. My, well, uh, for people who don't know, I'm wearing a YTV shirt, and I got it at uh, Anime North in 2018. It's official, but yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let me tell you, back in the day, so I'm, <laughs> I'm like 15 years old, and there was a science fiction convention up at York University called WinterCon. Yeah. So this must have been 2015. And um, you go into the dealer's room, and they had movie posters from the 1930s. A buddy was with me, and he bought a Forbidden Planet, uh, a six-foot Forbidden Planet poster. I think he paid five bucks, and today it's worth about thirty thousand dollars. Wow! And I, we, we were just—if I had a time machine, <laughs> I know where I'd be headed, mm -hmm. right? Because the stuff that we were buying, the stuff that we had. Today, would be, we wouldn't have mortgages on our houses. So mm -hmm. it was incredible. Um, and at this convention, there was uh, this, this guy in the hallway, an old guy, must have been in his 40s. And he's talking about comic books, mm -hmm. right? And there's like five or six people standing there. So I sort of wander over, 15 years old. This old guy's laughing and joking and talking about comic books. And then he finishes and he goes down the hall to the can or something. And I said, who was that? He goes, Stan Lee. And I go, <laughs> who's Stan Lee? He says, he created Spider-Man. I said, ah, I'm a DC guy. You know, and I walk the other way. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that's what it was like <laughs> back in the old 
is so I I, I sort of didn't meet Stanley, mm-hmm. um, but <laughs> yeah, but but that's what it was. And then uh, so I was making films all through high school, um, you know, very very like goofy goofy <laughs> stuff. And then I applied to Sheridan College. Now when I was in school, my parents did not want me to be a filmmaker. Mm-hmm. You know, you're not going to make a living. You're going to be a doctor or a dentist, you're going to have a profession. So I made a very concerted effort. I failed everything but English. Mm-hmm. You know, so the only place that would take me was Sheridan College for the famous animation program. Now, back in the day, like now to get in, you have to have the ACE portfolio. Back in 1978, you had to have tuition money and a pulse <laughs> and i was that bad i, I was like <laughs> terrible i was so bad that i was asked the the faculty came to me three times during my first year and asked me to drop out for the good <laughs> of the industry <laughs> right like like that's how they said it not only was it the faculty my favorite teacher Jim McCauley, who was like the Jedi master of animation teachers, the greatest who ever lived. He said, Steve, maybe you'll consider something else as a profession. (laughs) (laughs) You know, and that stung a little bit. That was the only thing that ever stung was that Jim asked me to leave, but I stayed. Mm -hmm. So, and I graduated. Now, the thing was that back in high school, uh, the North York Board of Education, which is now part of the Toronto District School Board, mm-hmm. had a program called Work Study, where they would get you into, say you wanted to be a baker, they would find a bakery, and you could be an assistant in a bakery for a week. Well, there was an animation studio here in town, yeah, uh, no longer around, and they got me in to be an animation helper, the lowest of the low. So I painted animation cells for a week. And I had a blast, and the the animators, the real guys, even took me for lunch a couple times. It was wow. incredible, you know. And it was this great little boutique studio. We were doing TV commercials, like really high end, big budget TV commercials and TV show openings, and we were doing educational stuff for TVO. It was great. And that summer, the summer between high school and Sheridan. I didn't want to go back to the hardware store where I was working. Mm-hmm. So I knocked and they remembered me and I had been polite to everybody. And they said, sure, come on down, you know. So they gave me a summer job and I was running from department to department to department, helping the cameraman, helping the airbrush artist, helping the film editor and all this. So by the time I got to Sheridan, I had like three months of professional experience under my belt. Mm-hmm which is a really dangerous combination because I knew nothing, but I thought I knew everything. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Which, which, which is dangerous. So that's part of the reason they wanted me to leave because uh, they would say something and I go, ooh, 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 sir, this is the way it's done, you know. Yeah. And they didn't like it. So I was always contradicting. <laughs> um, so that was that. Was that. I got through Sheridan, went back, and now I worked my way through Sheridan College at this studio. Yeah. And when I graduated from Sheridan, nobody else had a job. I walked into a job. Wow. Right? Yeah. I was the studio kid running from department to department and becoming pretty good, you know, because it had now been three years of part time work, weekends, holidays after school. I I was pretty proficient in many departments, mm-hmm. whereas kids coming out of Sheridan, you know, had done this a little bit, you know, soundtrack breakdown, analyzing the voice lip sync for all these things. I could do that and I could break down music. I could do all this stuff because the guys who taught me were top notch professionals currently in the business. I knew everybody at every film lab. I knew the special effects guys. I knew the audio recording guys, you know, I could phone up, hey, uh, John, how you doing? It's Steve, for, you know, and mm-hmm. they knew me. It was the kid. <laughs> it was great. Uh, and I had my own little office. It was just fantastic. So this went on about a year after I graduated. 
all these studios, all these little commercial studios had a five year lifespan. You know, they would, they'd make their money and they'd crash. So I found myself out of work. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> what do you do? Started knocking on doors and saying, Hey, you need a TV commercial. And the fact that there were like city TV, global TV, all these, they, they had departments doing the same thing, but they were affiliated with the sales department and anyone who was smart wanted their own commercial and then they could go and cut their own sales deal somewhere for a better price. So I was in a great position and, you know, just running, like I, I spent probably the next seven or eight years just running all over Toronto, um, making commercials, low budget commercials for really bad clients. But mm -hmm. I got so busy with this that one of the studios made a deal with me that I could keep my clients, my crappy little clients. Yeah. But they had, you know, at the end of every commercial, there's a graphic, mm -hmm. you know, buy our soap, or what, yeah. you know, whatever it is. Uh, yeah. And they were doing this for the biggest commercial production house in Canada, which was partners at the time. They had the deal with partners and they subcontracted everything to me. Mm -hmm. So I would come in on Monday morning, get the assignment, drop off the artwork on Thursday. We'd screen it for the client on Friday, right? And right. next Monday morning, I'd come in for the next assignment. And this was my job for a good four or five years. And it was, it was freelance, but it was steady. And mm -hmm. I worked on Captain Power, Soldiers of the Future, and all this. Along the same time, so I was working on an opening for a TV show. And some, some people saw me in the studio. And I'm just going from the editing to the camera room, you know, I'm just, All I'm a one man place. studio within, you know, I've, I've just hired out the studio, but these guys were also clients and I was working much faster than them. And they said, Oh, Nelvana uh, has an opening for a TV show, you know, uh, in their sound department. Mm -hmm. and, okay. And um, they set me up for an interview they had subcontracted the sound to this other company called Film Arts. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and I go for this interview. Now, what had happened is I had just been completely screwed over by two clients in a row. Yeah. You know, these big jobs had come in. I did, for whatever reason, I didn't take a deposit. I just shot out to work, did the, did the work, finished the commercial, this guy said, nah, don't like it, walked away. Just shafted twice in like two weeks and suddenly found myself like ten or twenty thousand dollars in debt. Wow. Right. <laughs> and this is in nineteen eighty three. Yeah. So this is forty years ago. And so twenty thousand forty years ago was a lot of money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so I walk into this meeting. You know, they, they want to interview me for this job. And there's this guy with the shirt, with the chains and the cigar, you know, and there's like three or four other people around the room. And this guy's just shoot me this look. And I didn't like, look, I didn't like the look of it, you know, like they're going to screw me over. Yeah. And I, I was like vicious in this meeting. Why the f should I work for you? I just f***ed over twice. Um, and they convinced me to take the job. You know, I, I just did it for the money. I said, okay, you pay me for the first two weeks before I do the work. And they said, yeah. no, we won't. You do work, you know, like a real employee. Ah, what have I got to lose? And, but it, it was good money, you know, so I did it. Mm -hmm. And they were honest and they paid me. So I kept working for them. This was doing uh, voice work, voice assemblies, which turned into sound effects on the Inspector Gadget show. Yeah. Right. So <laughs> I was about to guy, ask about that, but yeah, keep going. Yeah, so this guy with the open shirt and the chains and all this, his name was Don Haig, and he was the godfather of Canadian cinema. If somebody won an Academy Award, they thanked Don because Don had helped them in some way. And he was the most amazing, most giving person you ever saw in your life. Like, he 
he would go out of his way to help a kid off the street or you name it. He he was the man. Wow. Um, and I remember and, and I was with him for a good year doing Inspector Gadget. I remember we were out for lunch once and Don said that they didn't know what to think when I was in that interview because they had never seen anyone as angry, just furious as I was in an interview. <laughs> Right. He said, he said, you were insane. I said, that's my natural state. You know. <laughs> so anyhow, so that ends. I go back to making commercials and all this. And then um, at a certain point, I remember it's my 30th birthday. Right. Right. And I'm working on a commercial for Pepto-Bismol. I'm sitting in the screening room on Bloor Street at a big ad agency, and there was a cutaway glass man, and there's a glass stomach, and there's a ship, a little model ship, and it's in a storm. And I animated the pink Pepto Bismol going down his gullet to calm the storm. Ooh. Yeah. I'm sitting there. Is that somewhere online? You think have you found that? Yeah. They they did it a million times. There's a, a Mother's Pizza commercial with UFOs mm -hmm. that I did the shadows. I'm really proud of that one. Ooh. But that was one of my commercials. Mother's Pizza, uh, yeah, with, with the flying saucers. But so I'm sitting there watching this thing. I started to laugh. I said, this is my life. Mm -hmm. You know, this, this, this is the rest of my life. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I sort of look around and the ad agencies are, they're talking about the viscosity of the liquid and all this. And I looked up, I said, I can't do this anymore. I said, check please. And they had me and I walked out and I, I went home. I said to my wife, no, I can't do this. You're going to have to support me. I am going to, I'm, I was meant to tell stories. I was not meant to do this. And that was the turning point of the career. It was literally my 30th birthday. Wow. That's, yeah. that's a great story, man. That I, I was like, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's so absolutely, cool. absolutely true. Like what the f am I doing with my life? No mid mid course correction guys time for that. Mm -hmm. Sometimes so, that's what you got to do. <laughs> yeah. So I said, oh, okay, I'm going to tell short stories cause I can't afford to tell longer stories. It's going to be short stuff. And then, um, What's it going to be? Well, I'm going to do fairy tales. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But Disney has already done all the good fairy tales. He hadn't even done Little Mermaid or Lion King. You know, it's like, but, you know, Cinderella, Snow White. So I was going to do fairy tales from around the world. So I started researching them and all the really good ones were violent. Mm -hmm. You know, the purpose of fairy tale, um, uh, like if you tell a kid not to go into the woods because he might fall in the creek and drown, he's going to say, nah, I'm not going to drown. I'm, I'm okay. You know, mm -hmm. or if you say, Oh, there's a bad man in the woods and he might, nah, the bad man's not going to run the bad man. Right. But if you say there's a witch, their eyes bulge open. It's like, I'm yeah. not messing with no right. witch. <laughs> yeah. I'm messing with. Them. Yeah. So, so there was that. So I started looking all the, but they were so violent and to tone them down to get them on TV would suck all the life out of them. So, you know, screw that. Mm -hmm. So I didn't do that. Um, and I kept looking and I thought, are there modern fairy tales? Yeah. They're urban legends. And I came across books of urban legends and, you know, and the show was originally going to be called urban legends, but that's a, f a further story down the line. Mm -hmm. So I had to pitch it, right? What I did is I made a short film because I was in the film studio. So I shot this film on 35 millimeter film with a soundtrack, transferred it to video. Um, some, some family friends loaned me the money to do that. Um, and I paid them back. Nice. Um, nice. <laughs> and that's another story. And then, um, <laughs> Yeah, I, I went, I, I knocked on three doors. I went to CTV and they, 
I still have the rejection letters somewhere. They were pretty rude. Dang. I went to CBC and there was a well-known Canadian comic who was in charge of uh, entertainment. And so I show him my stuff and he says, what if you do a show and it's about the news one year from today? <laughs> I said, can you explain that again? He said, what if you do a show and it's the news one year from today? I said, well, it'll take a year to do it. So by the time I get it <laughs> out there, it's going to be no. Yeah. Right. So that, and I had never intended the show to be for kids, but it's animation. They might mistake it for kids. So I took it to YTV and there was a couple meetings mm -hmm. and they said, we'll give you development team. Right. So, and Not that bad. was that. Yeah, and um, it took four years from that point because I thought I could do everything. Mm -hmm. Right, I could I could raise the money, and nobody Telefilm Ontario Media Development they're not going to give you the money to do it if they don't know you because they don't know that you're not going to run off with it. Mm -hmm. Right, so they wouldn't give me the money. Um, finally, long story short. I met this producer guy who everyone said, John Dalmich gets things done, right? And I was at YTV had given me a deadline. I've got 90 days and I'd been running around. It was like day 86. And somebody said, John Dalmich. And I ran up to my office in Alvana and I phoned this guy. I said, John Dalmich, hi, my name's Steve Schneer and blah, 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 blah. He says, I'm in a meeting right now. I said, oh, you're in your office. He says, yes. Bang. <laughs> jumped in my car ran across town right <laughs> first into the office boom i said which one of you is john dalmich it's like six <laughs> guys in i'm john i said i'm steve he says yeah i said here's my stuff he said i'll read it i'll get back to you so that's day 86 and ytv was going to can the project at that point mm -hmm. day 7 88 89 90 it's dead Right. Yeah. So I, I I hadn't heard back from John. So I wrote this letter to YTV, thanking them for their support because they'd been with me for four years at this point. Yeah. And um, I was going to drop it off on because right across the parking lot, I was going to drop it off on my way out the door. And just as I'm getting my coat on, I've got the letter in my briefcase. The phone rings. Hi, Steve. It's John. We're on. I've already called YTV. They're good. Wow. <laughs> wow. You know, and, and that was that. So that's how John and I got together. Two most different personalities in the whole world, but it, it could not have happened without him. Mm -hmm. That's, that's amazing. Okay. Something yeah. out of like, so, a, yeah, <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. Go ahead. Do you have any other questions? <laughs> <laughs> I was just winding say... up and I'll go. <laughs> that's okay this is good this is great stuff like i want to hear from the people who talked about this stuff and just let them go on just go on about their stories and everything like that yeah. so yeah that's great but i did have like another st story uh before freaky stories uh because i i saw you also worked on the magic school bus and uh yeah tell me it, it, it said like you were a producer and what was your role as a producer because i feel like the role depends varying on the project but what did you do yeah okay I was a line producer on the Magic School Bus. I was dealing with the clients. I was trying to rein in the budgets. This was only on the first year. There had been a line producer before me on the show who had a nasty habit. Whenever a show would um, hit a bump, she would have a nervous breakdown. She'd quit that show, and the studio loved her for whatever reason. It's like, yo, you, you go off there, and we'll put the new guy in. So I, I inherited these difficult clients, mm -hmm. will be diplomatic and say they're difficult. Yep. And um, at that point, the director of the show, the long-term director, was a guy named Larry Jacobs, mm -hmm. right? Who never met, and we were supposed to be partners at this point. Yeah. So I meet this guy, who is incredibly funny. Um, and we immediately, immediately became like super tight pals. Um, th two weeks later, the two of us are walking down the main hallway 
at Nelvana. And we're, we're just going at it. We're, we're fighting like, like mad. And we're taking very, very funny shots at each other. Like we're, we're not mad. <laughs> yeah. We're just, just, just. Yeah. Yankee chains. Each other. Yeah. Just for, just for, yeah. I'm just jerking his chain. He's jerking my, just for the fun of it. And somebody said, how long have you guys known each other? <laughs> I said, oh, we met two weeks ago. <laughs> they said, you're like an old married couple. And so, you know, Larry and I, so Larry became Larry the Bug. Oh, <laughs> that's yeah. where he gets his name Larry from. The, yeah, yeah. And Larry the Bug, um, he's off in the corner. Um, and I've got the original sketch of Larry the Bug done by an artist pal of mine, Ted Bastine, who passed away earlier this year. Yeah. And it was like, uh, Ted, uh, going to make the bug Larry, make it look like Larry. Right. Yeah. Ted goes, yeah. So he drew and Larry, the bug is a caricature of Larry. Wow. Well, can we get like a good uh, shot of Larry? Just yeah. like pan the camera yeah. over. Look at that. That's so yeah. crazy. <laughs> so, so he's he's a character see what's happened is the foam latex has sort of it's break it's breaking down yeah you know um the fact that he's still intact it's a miracle is a miracle. <laughs> yeah because puppets of this age yeah they, they're, they're, they're not made to last forever like i always hear stories no, about they're made to last for a year or two yeah like sesame and street puppets and stuff yeah, like that yeah they dissolve. Yeah. So, yeah, they dissolve. So he should have dissolved by now. He's sort of frozen into position, and I'm really leery of moving him. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So there he is. Look Let's, at that. That's yeah. so crazy. <laughs> yeah. So oh. this is actually the second Larry. Oh, really? Uh, what happened is, you know the pilot one where we uh, were yes. all the Okay. <laughs> So the pilot, that was my original intention, what the stories were going to be like. What what I did is I did the art for the dog from Mexico story. A mm -hmm. uh, friend of mine, Glenn Hansen, did Spiders in the Hairdo. Mm -hmm. um, Carl Weens did... Uh, the elephant did one? The elephant one, which is actually a true story that happened to my father. Really? Okay. Yeah, yeah, and <laughs> um, and um, oh my god, Maureen! Oh my, forgive me, Maureen. Maureen, I forget her last name. Uh, did the one with the alligators in the sewer, mm -hmm. uh, and and my intention for the show was that we were going to just have open for artists everywhere in Canada yeah, that they could choose one of the stories. They could choose a script and they could illustrate it and we would do it with all the camera moves. And that's what it was going to be because in my heart of hearts, that's the purest form of filmmaking. Hitchcock said that once the storyboard was done, the film was done. The rest is just, you know, yeah. And, and I really believe that was true. Uh, still do. Um, but that's what I wanted to do. But then when Decode got involved with it, they were going to finance it. They said it's got to be done uh, over over in Korea with traditional animation techniques. Right. And again, it's the golden rule. Be with gold rules. So, <laughs> yeah. Oh, but wow. Like, I got to say, like, I... The, the elephant story i really didn't know if that was true or not but like just verb like maybe some things were some things like uh moved around with that story were you there for that or no no what had happened is my dad see if you see the story the cab is 425 that was my dad's license mm -hmm. okay my dad had a co-op cab are you in toronto i know toronto like the back of my head okay those, those red and yellow taxis. Mm -hmm. My dad had one of those. I was very, very young. It was probably about three or four at the time. And he was out at Rexdale Plaza. And there was uh, a circus. 
you know, those little circuses that sh- that's set up in the parking lots. Mm-hmm. He picks the guy up. The guy says, ah, take me out to Rexdale Plaza. Right. And, um, and he drops the guy off and the guy's with the circus. And my dad's car gets stuck in the mud in the parking lot. Guy says, no worries. Comes back with the elephant, pushes the elephant or pushes the car out of the mud and that's the end of the story wow what so you know i made this thing i sent it to my parents and their reaction was oh right (laughs) and i i said what's wrong it brought back very bad memories because we were poor yeah right we were quite poor at the time my dad was barely making a living as a cab driver and the elephant had crushed the back of the car Ooh. and the insurance company wouldn't believe him so he was on the hook for the repairs to the cab and it almost sunk us that story almost sunk us oh it's like i i wasn't aware like i remember seeing the back of the car caved in yeah but uh i didn't know the upshot uh financially how hard that had been on my parents but uh you know, and then uh, I remember after my dad passed away, going through his stuff, and he had a videotape, a VHS of the story, mm-hmm. and with his, thing. so he did like it in the end. <laughs> That's good, but that that mm-hmm. is wild. Yeah, like yeah, there's so many stories. When I've been watching the show with my brother recently, I watch. I started watching it last year, and then around Halloween time, I was like, "Hey, we should watch freaky stories together." And we've been after every story. We're like. I feel like that one could be true. This one, I I hope this one didn't happen to somebody or things like that. But it's been it's been a lot of fun thinking. It's like which Many one of these them things are is true? true? Many of them are true. There were um, there were we ran out of urban legends really quick. <laughs> the, what had happened is YTV greenlit the show, but they said we don't want to call it urban legends. We want to call it freaky stories. And I had, you know, one of the few times in my life where I kept my big mouth shut. I didn't say that sucks because I thought it really sucked. Um, <laughs> but I said, oh, that's fine. You're going to give us money. So I'm happy. Uh, but I really thought the name sucked. And but a week or so later, John casually referred to it as freaky. I said, yeah, OK, I can live with that. And then over the years, it, in my mind it's gained its own life yeah as uh, yeah yeah i think it's a good yeah. word it, I, I like the word freaky <laughs> I, li- I like the word but at the time in my mind urban legends yeah it's like it has like a mystique to it freaky is like yeah it it denotes it doesn't denote it doesn't get the point across it has like these are old legends passed down through time but i feel like with just the word freaky stories like uh it doesn't denote just like it could be anything like it, that's right urban legends that, horror that stories us, yeah that gave us so much freedom so much freedom to go beyond so a lot of the stuff uh was i can't think of any exact examples right now stuff that happened to me and my sisters or mm-hmm. uh, there was this one where these people go to the to the theater and there's a doctor and he's got a fecal sample. They're sort of moving around. That mm-hmm. happened to my wife's great aunt and great uncle. He was a doctor and she had been telling us this story. And she, um, and I phoned her. I said, could I, could I use that story in the show? Mm-hmm. And she said, yeah, I gave her, she was a wonderful lady. I gave her uh, heads up. It's going to be on this Tuesday night. And I remember when the show would air, my family had a had sort of a ritual on Tuesday nights where we'd sit on the couch. My daughter would sit on my knee. My son would sit beside me, my wife, and we would watch the episode, which I had seen a thousand times by that point. Oh, yeah, you were tired ready. of it by that point. <laughs> I, I was sick and tired, but I wanted to see it. And then the phone would ring. This is pre-internet. The mm-hmm. phone would ring, and the person the story was about would phone me to critique it it was really <laughs> great you know so so it was all family stories mm-hmm. 
like it was the, great like the what you just said about the fecal sample i sample i remember when me and my brother were watching that and we were like oh no doubt this is a true story <laughs> yes absolutely true and so i got this somewhat stern phone call from auntie k and uncle mike and <laughs> but they were laughing they were just laughing their heads off mm -hmm. so that was great uh yeah so Everybody in my family turned up in a freaky stories. I've been cut out of so many wills because of that. <laughs> That's <a laughs> oh, whatever. They've been immortalized <laughs> in, yeah. in that show. Yeah. But I know yeah. another, I, I remember listening to you on a podcast uh, like that you did three years ago. I think it was like the Mr. TV podcast and it was a yeah. really good yeah, yeah. listen. But I remember another story was uh, the mixed nuts where the old lady yes. uh, scraped yeah. off all the chocolate off of it and... I remember there was a YouTube upload of that and there are so many people who were like, oh yeah, this happened with some other kid in my school. He used to do this and some guy took his stuff and ate it and didn't know that happened. But yeah, I remember you saying that was like a real story from your family as well. No, 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 no. That was not a real story. That was, that was a joke I had heard that oh, I really? expanded the story, but I, I just wrote it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, sent it to my my buddy Doug Toms, artist who did the storyboard. So he does, he essentially designed the characters. They were refined by Phil Postma in Ottawa. And everything's hilarious. The show airs, my sister phones me and she says, that's our grandmother, isn't it? Ah. So, no, it's not. And she <laughs> says, look at the character. It's like, oh my God. Yeah. So you did so, it subconsciously. No, I had nothing to do with it. Somebody else. Oh, oh I see. It. I see. I see. So say, oh, that's her. Yeah. We did not get along. So <laughs> one of those wicked witch grandmothers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Still pretty, pretty funny. Pretty funny. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and the show was really great. Okay. So you were asked about stuff that nobody has ever heard before. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So I had this idea for a show. Okay. I had to get it on paper. So how do you organize your thoughts? Because I don't know how to organize. It. So what did I learn in school? How did, you know, remember in high school, you learned the five paragraph essay, mm -hmm. three, blah, 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 blah. That was the only thing of value I ever learned in school, <laughs> right? I actually hunted down my high school English teacher and told him, thank you. It was the only thing of value I learned in my life. The rest of it, I could have been off at a pool hall. Um, <laughs> so what I did is I forgot, you know, I, I, it's like three passions, three passions, no internet. So I go to the library and I just go to the library and I said, there's, there's this essay we had to study, three passions about this and then, you know, just, oh, it's the introduction to Bertrand Russell's autobiography. Yes, that's it. So she, I photocopy it and five paragraph essay. So I wrote, Blah, 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 blah. And my pitch document, like a pitch Bible, is like 20 pages. I had one page, daisy wheel printed, mm -hmm. right? One piece of paper and some photographs and the little video I had made. And that's what I pitched and that's what I sold the show on. Wow. It was okay. So then we did the pilot. Uh, I wrote the pilot. And then the pilot got on TV. You guys saw it. Um, and then we go into production on the show and John hires this guy named Simon Muntner, who is no longer with us. Simon was this wonderful guy. He was like, um, I had this favorite grandfather who passed away probably 15 years before that. He was the first of my grandparents to go. He was my favorite. And Simon was like the reincarnation of my favorite grandfather but he was a writer mm -hmm. right? and wonderful sense of humor. And he put up with my sh <laughs> and uh, we're about halfway through the first season and we're having lunch and Simon's talking about, okay, now in the first act, you did this. And in the second act of the story, you did this. Now for the third act, I said, I got a question. He says, yeah, what? I said, what's an act? <laughs> he said, what? I said, what's an act? I, I hear people talk first, second, third, but I don't know what an act is. He says, you've got your own TV show. You don't know how to write? I said, 
I tell a story. And so he sat me down and over lunch, he explained three act story structure. He recommended some books, which I devoured. Then I went back and I analyzed my stuff and I corrected my stuff and I became a scholar of the three act story structure. <laughs> but I was halfway through the first season and I didn't know the first thing about writing, which for the people out there in podcast land tells you that you don't need to go to film school, right? You don't need to listen to those storytelling gurus. You know, if you have a story and you've been watching enough TV and you sort of understand and you can do it by your gut feel, do it by your gut feel. Mm -hmm. So a little takeaway there. Yeah, definitely. I've, I've learned that when I've been making like videos and things like that, where I think I'm doing this right. It feels right. And I put it out there yeah. and people are like, hey, this is really good. This Are you like a professional writer? I'm like, no, not really, but <laughs> I'm glad you like it. I liked it. You know, so for for every job, I, I, there was this um, show called Atomic Betty. Yeah, yep. Okay, so I had pitched a show. The studio that was doing Atomic Betty wanted the show. They didn't have enough money for the uh, option that I wanted, you know, they want to option the property. So I said, okay, give me this much in cash and two stories on Atomic Betty. Mm -hmm. You got the production season two, you're starting season two. Okay. So they put me on to Atomic Betty and a quick little thing. If you're ever writing something, you come in in a, in a TV show, she's a girl, she goes into space, she fights bad guys. Okay. And they, for, they had done 52, episodes in season one 52 11 minute episodes yeah and here we're season two and she had fought 52 different bad guys <laughs> right what am i going to do that's going to make me stand out okay so i looked all the i looked at all the outlines i didn't bother to read the scripts because they're all <laughs> um <laughs> and well after you've done your own show everything else is shit. okay so <laughs> i'll write I that go, down okay who is atomic betty who is this person, right? Yeah. Oh, she's a 10-year-old girl. Wait, I have a 10-year-old girl upstairs. So that night at supper, I listened to my daughter and just sat there listening to her. She's so mad. She's mad at Sarah. Sarah is her best friend, and they've had a fight. She hates Sarah. So I wrote the script where Atomic Betty uh, hates the mean girl, right? But the mean girl has been kidnapped by the bee people to be their queen. She's the mean queen of outer space, right? And Betty, being a hero, has to rescue the person she hates most in the world. I like that. Right? Well, the guys at Atomic Betty had never seen anything like that. The next thing you know, I am the executive story editor of the whole show. Because <laughs> taking it, right? They said, can you story edit? And I said, sure I can. <laughs> <laughs> Make it till you make it. Uh, that was it exactly. The show that I had pitched never happened, but I made more money off of that stupid show that never happened because of Atomic Betty than off of any other show, including Freaky Stories. That's wild. I love that. So, so, it, it, so all my career has been, you know, can you do open heart surgery? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> as far as you know, as far as I know, I think I can do it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you've got enough people in the room who are going to keep you from making a terrible mistake. Yeah, of course. <laughs> but that's like... Yeah, I've done it before. Lots of times. That's inspiring. So, yeah. yeah. Just... See, that's what happened with me on Freaky Stories. Like, can you direct? Sure, I can direct. I can do this. I'll learn on the job. I, I'll, I'll do this. I'll, I'll take all the... You know, if, if anything happens, it's on me, but I'll make sure that I get things done the best I can. But <laughs> We did the pilot of Freaky Stories. See, this is not the original puppet. The original puppets across the room. Mm -hmm. But what happened is these guys cost in 1980, no, 1995, 1997 dollars. This guy was 15,000 bucks. This guy was 5,000 mm bucks. -hmm. Okay. So we built the first Larry. And the puppeteer's name was Jim Rankin. We built the Great puppet. Guy. Yeah. The pilot, 
and uh, Jimmy comes in. We've seen the puppet be. It's like probably the week before, and Jim comes in, and he can't get his hand inside the puppet's head because the mechanism was too big. He can barely. He can't even get his fingers. In, right. It's like, yeah. We did. We didn't measure the puppeteer. Right. It was an effects house that built. It wasn't a puppet house. And like they, they weren't used to building this sort of puppet and puppet houses couldn't build something that looked like this. So we had a problem. So we brought in Gord Robertson. Mm -hmm. We did the pot. So when you see the one with the, the static images moving under the camera, that Larry looks very different from this one. Yeah. Okay. Cause this, complete redesign and what they did is they brought in the puppeteers they cast their arms and built the puppets around the puppeteers arms nice so yeah but basically we took a fifteen thousand dollar puppet about the price of a new car back then and trashed it <laughs> he, he's sitting in the corner from there across yeah so we, we were making mistakes because nobody had ever done a show like this before mm-hmm and, you know, people who hear these stories are like, okay, I'm going to learn from their mistakes and make sure that I don't mess up as bad. No, you, make, you, make, you always make mistakes. Mm -hmm. Be prepared. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah. So we were writing the stories. We had the puppets. Um, it was great. Like, uh, year round, we're writing the stories, doing the animation for three weeks every august the circus would come to town the puppeteers the sets the sound stage <laughs> and uh it was great it was you know because you know i'd say we need a flying saucer for episode six i think and they built me a flying saucer across the room there you know <laughs> uh, or, or we need this we need that or and we had we had uh, this wonderful costume lady who was tailoring stuff for for Larry and Maurice. She made all the costumes. She made uh, Maurice's. Let me just turn this around. Mm -hmm. Maurice's there baseball he is. hat. Yeah. <laughs> now, this one. I was directing this episode, mm -hmm. um, and I forget what Maurice was supposed to say, but I'm sitting there, you know, watching the monitor, and. Dan Redican, who is probably the sickest human being on the face of this earth, uh, <laughs> is operating Maurice, and he slides up into position, right? And he says, when I wear this hat, I get so much... <laughs> oh, dear. And everyone cracked up, and I didn't yell cut. I'm just sitting there, and I'm sitting there, and I'm sitting there, and Barney... Barney Stewart, the cameraman, may he rest in peace. Barney gets off the camera dolly and he walks over to me and he says, he's not breathing, right? I was laughing so hard I couldn't catch my I'm just like this. <laughs> Barney just wallops me in the back, says, breathe, death. I go, ah. <laughs> it was the funniest thing. But the guys, Danny and Jim and Stephen Brathwaite, who was the other puppeteer on Larry, they were going out of their way to kill me, to, to make me laugh so hard that I forgot. And I actually had spare underpants in my briefcase, just, just in, in case. case. Never knew it. Just in case. <laughs> always spare underpants. But that's what it was like. It was a story. I did not see this. I hung out with the puppeteers all the time because mm -hmm. they were such bastards. But apparently, <laughs> Stephen Brathwaite went into the puppeteer lounge they had their own lounge. Mm -hmm. And the story is, and I do not know this for certain, mm -hmm. that Danny, uh, Dan Redican, was lying face down on the couch, naked, with a rose sticking out from his butt cheeks. <laughs> I sure hope the rose didn't have thorns in it. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. But it, it must have been there for a good 20 minutes waiting for somebody to <laughs> but but i missed it and somebody told stephen brathwaite told that story uh, and i said yeah i believe it that's that's what it was all about 
That's the freakiest story of them all. <laughs> no, no, there there was stuff going on. It was just, it was just insane. It, it was so much fun. It really was. Like, um, did you see the one where Larry Maurice, where the new chef takes over the French chef, and he's going to fumigate and kill the bugs? Yes. And there's a giant newspaper, and they're singing down. a song. Okay. So, um. I didn't direct that episode. Steve Wright, who directed a lot of kids shows, was directing the live action for that. Yeah. Uh, the props department had built this giant newspaper out of um, carpet underlay foam and all this. And they had like drawn all the lines and pictures and rolled it all up. <laughs> and then they built this rigging on a track that went across the top of the sound stage, And there was like a pulley thing. And these two guys were sort of jumping up and down, making the thing go. And then these two guys pulling, pushing the rig to propel the whole thing as it's chasing to kill the puppets. Right? My son, who was like six years old at the time, is he would hang out on the set because of summer vacation. And he worshipped uh, Jim Murray, the props guy. And Jim had built this thing. And so... Uh, we're ready we're ready to shoot this and i think we only shot it once but steve wright said to my son michael he said okay you say action and michael goes action and the puppets are running along they're screaming this thing's going womp 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 and these two guys on the pulley are being pulled into the air up and down all this mayhem cut beautiful we i think we did it again for safety yeah and then we get home, you know, at the end of the day, and it's supper time, and mom puts supper on the table, and she says, how was it today? And Michael goes, it was okay. Of course. <laughs> That's what they all what say. It okay? <laughs> you know, and, and I, I said, and I described what happened. Yeah. And Michael said, yeah, I got to say, yeah, but Jim Murray did all the real work. You know, you didn't, you didn't do anything. You just told Jim what to build. And I go, yeah. And then he turns to me and says, did you pay Jim Murray to think up freaky stories for you? And you know you know how Homer strangles birds? I was about to say, so that's what, yeah. I was going to do this, but I wasn't. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah, like, yeah. You little, you little bastard. Yeah. So, how dare you? <laughs> I brought you into this so, world. Yeah, so he, he's grown up. He is, he is a fully functioning human being. I left him alone. Yeah. It, everything works out. I'm glad it worked yeah. out like that. <laughs> yeah. So, so freaky, freaky was uh, was really great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That that those are some amazing stories. Just on just about the. I love hearing stuff like what goes on behind the scenes, and yeah. <laughs> it, it was so much fun. But the, the funny thing is that um, there was a guy a few years ago who made a documentary on freaky stories called my freaky stories he came to my place he interviewed me um um he went to ottawa he interviewed other people john declines all these interviews john's retired he doesn't want to have anything to do with it mm -hmm. um but when he was talking to the other people you know for me it took me 10 years to get this thing on the air from the time i had the idea to the time it got on the air this was my obsession that i had to get this show done and he was talking to the other people so they're like yeah it was a job it was like three weeks a year you know we mm -hmm. had a good time everybody was nice yeah and it's like you know that's their perspective on it and i really respect that yeah and but but to them it's it's like nothing special it's just just another gig mm -hmm. so i don't bother about it you know it's mm -hmm. like you know and, and for me it's like 25 years in the past now so mm -hmm. but, yeah yeah great yeah. i love hearing like if anybody has anything to say even if they don't think it matters in the long run i want to hear what went on behind like the scenes and what you guys were thinking because like as a creative myself and a guy who wants to get all the information out there I feel like, yeah, this the, these stories, even if the guys who made it don't think they're all that crazy, they need to be told, I feel like. Yeah, well, there was stuff like this going on all the time. 
like uh, we would we would mix the shows, you know, every Friday, especially in season one. We we're doing it in Toronto. There's mm -hmm. a documentary on YouTube where somebody is critiquing freaky stories. And it, I agree with everything this person said. Yeah. You know, like everything, everything this individual said is correct. Like the audio in season one. Yeah. Is wrong. It's a little you know, wonky. It's wonky. And we knew it. But what happened is we kept saying to the audio house master's workshop that what we're getting on TV is not what we heard and approved in the studio. No, no, no. It's all the same. No, we can hear the difference. No, no. It's, it's perfect. Everything is perfect. And this went on for the whole year. And in season two, we took it to a different house. And then years later, we were told that, yes, there was a mistake. There was a problem in the room. And what we were approving was not what people heard at home. Wow. That's you know, crazy. So, so we were really pissed off. Mm -hmm. And so we, we pulled all the work out of that place and took it somewhere else. That's insane, because, yeah, I was the first thing I noticed when we were watching, me and my brother were watching Freaky Stories, like, is the music a little loud? <laughs> and I was like, it gets better in yeah. season two. I'm not sure what's going Maybe it was like, maybe that was it like this yeah. in like back in the day? Or is it like the current masters on like this oh, streaming no, 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 service? No, no, no. But yeah, yeah, it was all there from the beginning. All there. And we, we flagged it right at the beginning. Mm -hmm. We said there was a problem here. And they said, there's no problem. And, and they were saying, oh, no, everything's fine. And we, what we heard in the room, we, you know, we had, the composer was with us. We had everything together. And we're hearing it, and it's right, and everyone signed off on it. And then, you know, and it was funny, at the end of every mix session, they'd sort of turn around, everyone in the room would sort of turn around to me and John for our approval. John would always nod. And I'd say, well, that didn't suck. And I'd get up and I'd walk <laughs> out of the room. Right? And John would get so angry. He'd say, what do you mean that doesn't? You're supposed to say it sounds good. And I said, yeah, it's good. The show's good. Right? It didn't suck. That's yeah. all, you know. <laughs> and John said, no, you're supposed <laughs> to praise everybody. I said, that is my praise. We didn't suck this week. You yeah. Know, that's, you know, we're, we're always aiming to be better. Mm -hmm. And that, that was like my entire philosophy that drove everybody crazy um most producers if you talk to producers today listen carefully because if you talk to the head of this studio or that studio or this distributor they'll say well we have 900 half hours in our library we have 3700 half hours and 2500 hours of, you know they never say is it any good yeah i was yeah right <laughs> And, and I used to drive everyone crazy because I said, this story, this particular story, you know, we did 140 stories, mm -hmm. but this story that we are working on right now, in 25 years, somebody's going to come back and mention it to me that it is their favorite story that it shaped their childhood, right? And I have a responsibility. You don't, but I have the responsibility to that kid that their favorite story has to be great, as great as I can make it given the time and budget, right? So it, for me, it was like this, this wonderful agony because I have a responsibility to somebody who probably hasn't been born yet that their favorite story has to be great. And everyone's going, why are you doing this to yourself, Steve? No, don't, don't it's do for that. the art, for the art. Yeah. But I love that. Well, it wasn't for the art. It wasn't for the art. It was for a kid out there because some kid is going to love this yeah. and it's my responsibility to make it as good. And, and what's happened is I get hundreds of people, you know, there'll be a Reddit thing. Does anyone remember freaky stories? And, it's mm -hmm. like hundreds of, and sometimes you'll see that I'll come across it. I'll say, Hey guys, we did it for you, you know, mm -hmm. and that's great. You know, yeah. And my real reward, you know, it's somebody like you say, Hey Steve, can we talk? Yes, of course we can talk. You know, my wife's upstairs going, "Oh, please, please." <laughs> yeah, uh, but but yeah, like I, you know, if somebody uh, politely says, "Hey, do you have time to talk?" I will make all the time. You know, yeah, all the time you 
for, yeah. for, for the people who for the people at home like when i first contacted you steve you're like yeah i'm free here here's my phone number it's like <laughs> phone number that's that's crazy i just said hello and all this stuff and <laughs> and i was like no we got to get this immortalized in like a video call and all this other yeah, stuff yeah, but yeah, yeah. yeah it's like he is more than happy to talk about his show that is the yeah. greatest thing in the yeah. world <laughs> yeah. and yeah and we had fun we really really did have fun with it it shows Which, yeah yeah it was insane it was insane and the other thing is the doors were open you know if you if, if like simon the story editor was teaching at ryerson at the time metropolitan trauma university or whatever it's called now mm -hmm. and he he was letting his students know if you wanted to pitch a show, you know, doors open. He, we were accepting pitches. So there were so many people who got their first writing gigs, so many composers, because the we the composers, you know, the, the doors were open. You know, it didn't it did it paid fairly. Mm -hmm. It didn't pay well, but we weren't ripping people off. We had enough money that everyone was paid scale at least or better than so yeah. uh you know and we paid promptly and you know and so we... everybody had a good time and generally my idea was here's the story right go do your thing uh delight me yeah. surprise me and i remember especially uh we were dealing with a studio called fun bag in ottawa mm-hmm now i had promised my buddies this is another thing um if you have an idea for a show or a project and you want to do it with your buddies don't make promises right. because i had promised we're going to set up our own studio we're going to do our own animation we're going to do it our way it's going to we're going yes. to screw it's gonna, yeah <laughs> <laughs> the money guys said we're doing it at fun bag studios in ottawa damn Damn, <laughs> Ottawa, they were any good, they'd be here in Toronto. Now, when we're doing Magic School Bus, we're dealing with American clients. The attitude was, if you were any good, you'd be in Los Angeles. We were pretty damn good. Yeah. So the guys from Decode dragged me. Like, literally, you're getting in the van, we are driving to Ottawa, and they, for four hours, six hours up to Ottawa, they're telling me the virtues of fun bag studios and i'm going blah 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 yeah, you know, <laughs> the whole and um we get out there and every they roll out the red carpet and they are so nice to me and these guys you know these experienced artists they bring out their portfolios and i look at the portfolios and they are as good as anything in toronto right and everyone is nice Right. And this decode will not finance my studio. Mm -hmm. So we did it in Ottawa. And those guys became, we're 25 years later, we're, we're all in touch with each other. We're lifelong friends. And I remember there was uh, every year there'd be a new animation director. People were moved around. You know, it, it had nothing to do with, you know, promotion or demotion. They were moving from project to project. Yeah. And, by the end of the third season, not even the end of the third season, but well, well into the production, it was like, if I got a design or a character or something or something in the storyboard wasn't what I had asked for, what I had in mind, I'd look at it. And before I lift up the phone, I'd say, what did Jerry have in mind here? Mm -hmm. I'd look at it. What is Jerry thinking that I'm missing? Right. And I'd say 90% of the time, I would approve it. it. Wasn't what I had in mind, but he's he sees something that I don't see. I trust him. Right. And then 9% of the time, I'd phone Jerry up and say, Jerry, what did you mean by this? And Jerry would explain. I'd say, ah, I'm stupid. Thank you. And I'd approve it. <laughs> And 1% of the time, I would disagree with them, but I would still approve it because I trusted these guys and they never led me wrong. You know, so you, you built up 
uh, a level of trust with these people. It's just, just tremendous. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah. Uh, so let's see. Another question I had, uh, speaking more about uh, Larry and Maurice, uh, a friend of mine, uh, he asked, uh, was there ever consideration for a Larry Maurice spinoff or just a more general puppet centric direction for the show? After the show, well, first of all, the guys at Decode hated the puppets. The puppets were very, very expensive. Mm -hmm. The shoot was very expensive. They once brought in um, somebody from Mainframe that they had a deal with. And Mainframe did Reboot. Yeah. That show. Yeah. And they said, I remember this. Oh. They said, well, we can recreate the diner in three-dimensional computer graphics. We can have the puppets crawling, the insects crawling all over the diner. And I go, well, if you've seen the show, they play in close-up. Mm -hmm. So they don't have, right? Yeah. I said, lip sync. Your lip sync is not as good as the puppeteer lip sync. They said, well, we can, we can, you know, salesman, salesman, salesman talk. And I was ready. I knew they were coming in for this. So I had my, my videotape, my, my uh, VHS tape queued up. I said, okay, I'll make you a deal. If you can do this, then we'll do it. Okay. If you can honestly say you can duplicate this. He said, okay, what is it? I put the tape in. This guy slides up to the camera. Before we did every tape with Maurice, we grease him up with the slime. And we put a big gob of slime in his mouth, right? Comes up to the camera, he goes, Larry, teach me how to be charming. And when he says charming, this big glob of snot comes out of his <laughs> mouth. Everyone cracks up. I said, can you do that? And they said, no, we can't do that. I said, then we stick with the puppets. Thank you. Goodbye. And I left the room. Huh. And they were so mad at me because, you know, it, it was costing it was costing like 50,000 bucks a day to shoot the pups. It was costing some insane amount of money because we had a whole sound stage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's probably why. Uh, yeah. So like with season two and three, they are like greatly reduced in the show. And I can tell. No, they're like, not. Well, no, they're not. like their segments are a lot shorter than they were in season one. Yeah. Yeah. Like they still have segments in there, but they're like 10 seconds long compared to. Like in season one, their their segments were like a minute, thirty seconds, but in seasons two, three and two and three really? Yeah, they're like, Hey, we're here. Here's the next freaky story. And then they'll after the story is done, they'll maybe do something for like maybe ten, fifteen seconds and they're like, Here's our next freaky story. It's really well, short. What, what 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 we did in season one. In season one we had direct throws to individual stories. Yeah. And here's a story about the girl with the spiders in her, you know, that sort of thing. And then in season two and three, we say, here's another freaky story. The reason was that one of the, somebody came in and said, the way you structure the show as an anthology is you have your best story first. Okay. In the number two position is the weakest story. In the number three position is the, is the next weakest. And then the second best is in the fourth position. So that when th people think back on the episode, they remember the first story. It was great. You know, somebody's tuning in. Oh, that was great. This next one sucks. By the end of the episode, they forgot the one that sucks. Yeah. When we did, where we said, here's the story about the spider and the hairdo, or here's the story about a guy who, you know, and all that. Then we were locked into putting those into that position. Ah. But this way, it gave us the latitude in the editing room to say, okay, this one's number one, this one's two, three, and four. Mm -hmm. that, that was the only change that I remember. But like, I remember season three, the very last freaky story was uh, the masked maggot with the maggot mobile. Because mm -hmm. I wrote that. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, I wrote and I directed that one. It's not the best, but we blew our the last of our props budget on the maggot mobile. Um, <laughs> that thing, that thing was so cool. And, <laughs> it, 
but yeah, because like, yeah. uh, because season one, I, I think they're, I think they're all the same length. Uh, I I would have to disagree with you there, because you would be right. Hey, I'm a senile old man. Because <laughs> season uh, one, they had like great. They they had their own things going on with their own thing with their own stories, and yeah, the uh, season one stories are four minutes long. Seasons two and three are, I checked this, they're like four minutes, 45 seconds. So three minutes of the L- Larry and Maurice's stuff is gone. That's interesting. Yeah. I do not remember this. I do not remember this. Yeah. Oh, well. Ch- check out yeah. some of the season two episodes and you're like, wait, did, did Larry and Maurice just disappear? Hmm? I'd have to watch the movie. <laughs> <laughs> they're, take it from me. They're good. <laughs> but, yeah. yeah. Well, when, when they're good, they're they're really good. When they're bad, they're as good as anything else out there. You know? I would say so. that too. There hasn't been like a story I've seen where I'm like, that stunk. I haven't seen that. It was one. It was one story. I can't remember which one. <laughs> John would occasionally commission a story. Somebody would submit it. John would say, we're putting this in production. And I'd find out it's in production. Right? Mm-hmm. He's already paid the money. And then, so there's one guy writes the story. And it stinks. And Simon, the story editor, and I, we bat this thing around for like weeks. You know, it doesn't go into this episode. We put that, you know, because it's not ready. It's not ready. It's not finally put it into production. We paid for it. That's awful. Right. It's not a good story. And it goes into production, goes into the show. It's like, Probably the stinkiest, freaky story ever. You know, but we did the best we could. Mm-hmm. Nobody's. So, two weeks late, I'm picking my kids up from daycare. They're in the back seat. They are slaughtering each other in the back seat. They're screaming. They're pinching, pulling hair. They're fighting. They're, we shut up. You, you know, my phone rings. Mm-hmm. This guy goes, Hey, Steve, this is Ron. You know, I'm a Canadian writer living in LA. And he goes, oh, yeah, hi, Ron. What can I do for you? Actually, can you call me tomorrow? You can hear my kids are killing each other in the back seat. <laughs> he goes, No, Steve, I got to talk to you right now. I got an idea for a pitch. I said, Please call me tomorrow because my kids are killing each other in the back seat and I can't concentrate on our phone call. He goes, No, 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 no. You see, I did this freaky story for you already. You already bought it. You loved it. It's, I saw it on the air. It's like, blah, 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 blah. And I go, Okay, yeah. I've asked you twice to call me tomorrow. As far as your freaky story, no, it hadn't been on the air yet. Uh, I said, we had to rework that so much. I think I left two of your consonants in the original script. Hmm. Right. And he goes, what? You, you touched my story? I said, we got the right. You know, we bought it. We paid for it. We can do what we want. Goodbye. Do not call me. Right. Fine. Get my kids home. Walk into the studio the next morning, John. Right, poor John. The things I did to him, <laughs> John. Let let me just John. John Dalmage is a wonderful, 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 patient, good person, and he had this maniac as a business partner. Like John is neat. He is super neat. Everything is aligned neatly on his desk. If John would get out would get up and leave the room you know i'm going for a coffee i'll be right back i would get up and i would move around the room and I'd make all the picture frames crooked <laughs> right, just, just fit. and i'd take his pen and i'd move it just like that just <laughs> you know, and sit down you know so i would come back <laughs> and you wouldn't know that it's me right <laughs> but it would just drive me crazy <laughs> You're, you're crazy. <laughs> but I had to do these because, because you know. So, and and in all the years we were together, we never had lunch together. We never had coffee together. It was all I, I just drove him so crazy. Um, so <laughs> next morning I come in, and John said, "What did you say to this Ron guy?" I said, "Oh." That yeah, I said. I told him we left a couple of our con- of his consonants in the in the script. He said, "Yeah." I said, "So what's the problem?" He said, "His lawyer called YTV and they're trying to get you fired from the show." 
Oh. And I said, well, he'll never work in Canadian television again. Right? Ha! He goes, Steve, you can't do that to me. I said, I can't. <laughs> right. and, okay. So every year I would go to the festival, the TIFF. I go to TIFF. Yep. And you go to these parties and all this, and there was some agent, and she comes up. And he says, "Oh, you do freaky stories." Well, one of my writers just wrote, right? Mm -hmm. And I said, "Oh yes, I remember him." Uh, he turned in a crappy story. We got it somewhat to work. Uh, he threatened, or he tried. He contacted YTV to uh, have me fired from the show that I created. That's it. Do you have anyone else that you represent? <laughs> I, you know, so periodically I look in on this guy and he's teaching at a community college somewhere in the United States. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'm not sure what that story could be, though. But do you remember? Any... It was with pigeons. There's pigeons in a fountain. That's all I remember. Pigeons, with pigeons and a fountain. I know there was one with birds and a football field. That would be field. season two. Yes. Season... Okay. Yeah. Yeah, there was there was the one with the pigeons, and there's a guy, a football, a football guy, and he goes to like this prestigious school, and he gets like all the birds to poop on like the other teammates. Is that the one? Yeah, yeah, that that's ringing. I remember there were pigeons in a fountain. Okay, so, yeah, yeah. but I, it's, say, one yeah. Of those things, it's one of those things I don't want to remember because it's like then then it occupies space in my brain that could be used for something else. Yeah, I get that. Yeah. Yeah. All I'll say is that that one did st st uh, stick out to me as, you know, that one wasn't particularly great Freaky Stories material, so now I know why. <laughs> Remember the one where they go to the Grape Juice Factory? Yes, and the Hawks and, and the thing. Really happened. Really? To who? Yeah, yeah. When I, was, when I was in junior high school, we went on a trip out to Niagara Falls area. And there was the Welch's Grape Juice Factory. Sorry, Welch's Grape Juice. I lived <laughs> on Welch's I love that stuff. Anyhow, so we are in the factory. Mm -hmm. And we're on, literally on the gangplank over these vats, right? And uh, a buddy of mine. Right? No! Like, what's That's wrong right. with you? <laughs> Never drank Welch's Grape Juice again. No kidding. <laughs> no kidding <laughs> to this very day you have you've looked at welch's in like the grocery store and it's like that kid that I kid ruined it for me <laughs> yeah i just don't drink grape juice yeah but absolutely <laughs> true see what what was happening is we were mining our own lives and stuff yeah and it was really great because there was this chinese restaurant on spadina avenue the new excellent peking house mm-hmm and every Tuesday afternoon, Simon and I had this big table at the back. And everyone in our circle knew that you could come to the table and pitch shows. Right? We need hot sour soup and all this stuff. And you could come and there'd be laughter. This, this would go on for two or three hours. We would just, whoever told the funniest story, you got the assignment, go for it. It was it was great. Good stuff, yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see. So another question I got. Uh, let's see. So uh, I was thinking about like uh, how season one also had uh, Rosie, the unseen waitress, and uh, what was the whole story behind like getting rid of the live action set in season one? It was expensive. Yeah, probably just that's just it. Oh yeah. Yeah, see, yeah, uh, we we had the idea of the diner. Um, it was very expensive. Uh, basically, what happened is my wife and I went on Diner Tour USA, where we took about two weeks, and we chartered all the diners, and we went to all these places. And there's a place called the Bird's Eye Diner in Castleton, Vermont. Mm-hmm. I said, this is it. And the owner very, very kindly allowed us to crawl all over the diner and photograph everything. And, and, and like behind the counter, everything. 
Uh, so if you ever get to Castleton, Vermont, and you walk into the Bird's Eye Diner, it is Larry's Diner or Ted's Diner is a replica of the Bird's Eye. That's crazy. Yeah, I looked that up and I was like, oh, wow, it's still there to this day. That's awesome. It's still there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And was very, very kind. I think we sent him pictures afterwards. Never heard back. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so it was literally the Bird's Eye Diner. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. And I know that the chefs in the uh, background in the pictures were you and Ted Bastian and Bastian, Bastian yeah. and, and uh, yeah. so, someone I saw a comment on YouTube. They thought when they when they were a child, they thought that the chefs in the background were Larry and Maurice as humans before they got turned into insects for whatever reason. But oh, that's cool. Yeah, I was that's like, cool. that's a cool no, no, no. that's a cool headcanon. <laughs> no, no, we did that. We did that. um specifically we, we were putting visual signatures you know we were here yeah uh, because there's always somebody claiming your work you know oh i did that or i did this or you know um actually had that happen where this guy phoned i got a phone call from john mm -hmm. and he said do you know oh hell he took it to court or he wanted to, Jeffrey Mueller of Magpie Productions. I'll say his name, right? Mm -hmm. And I go, nope, never. Jeffrey Mueller? No, I do not know him. He says, well, he created Freaky Stories. And this was years after the show had ended. Yeah. I said, no, I created Freaky Stories. He says, well, his lawyers are suing YTV and um, his newspaper in Buck, Saskatchewan. Uh, they, they've got this article of how a uh, big corporation ripped him off. I go, really now? He goes, yeah, can you prove that you predate this guy? And I said, absolutely. Yes, I, I said, when did, yeah, when did he um, pitch the show to YTV? He says, well, he says he pitched the show in 1990 three i said 1993 you say he said yeah he, he said he pitched sometime in 1993 i said stand by your fax machine okay. <laughs> you know, or, yeah i'm you know, sending you an email i went to my file and i had my letter from 1991 saying hey steve we look forward to doing development with you on this show urban legends right yeah so i sent it to john we sent it to their lawyer saying this predates your claim by two years right and they crawled back under their rock okay so then this guy you know this guy is suddenly on my radar and and on his website he says the creator of freaky stories so here's his phone number i phone him up i said what the f is wrong with you mm -hmm. right? You're telling a lie he said i said take it off your website or i will sue you into a hole in the ground yeah and he says, well, you know, I, I said, you did nothing on the show. You saw it on TV, you moron. Mm -hmm. And uh, he says, well, you know, and what it turns out is he had gone to Nelvana for a storyboarding test. What they do is they give you a chunk of a script and they say, do a storyboard. and We'll see if you're any good. Mm -hmm. So whoever, they were my buddies. They had freaky story scripts. Here, do a freaky story script. <clears throat> he does a script. It's no good. They don't hire him. He said, well, I did all this work. I own this show. And they owe me money. You know, so I phoned this guy back. I said, I figured out your story. Okay. Somebody gave you a freaky story. This is a storyboard test. Now you think you own your show and you're trying to blackmail us for money. I said, can I give you some advice? And he says, yeah, what advice? And I said, Next time you're taking credit for someone else's work, take credit for, for a show that actually made money. <laughs> you know, they say that you invented SpongeBob and they'll pay you a million dollars to go away. I don't have a million dollars to pay you, so I'm going to fight you. <laughs> <laughs> Makes sense to me. <laughs> yeah. Like, say that you created Star Trek, you know? Yeah. It's like they'll, coming they'll after pay, me. Pay <laughs> yeah. I'm the wrong guy to, to come after because yeah. number one, we'll fight. Mm -hmm. So, that's, yeah. Yeah, pretty good. Yeah, it's, it's good how you, you, you 
and also how you pasted your stuff in there and just yeah it's like irrefutable yeah. proof that's me that's my show <laughs> yeah. yeah that's what we did uh we did that and there's stuff all over it um there's little signatures everywhere mm -hmm. that, that yeah oh what was it a friend of mine also the, the same friend who asked the story about the uh the puppets he also has a freaky stories t-shirt that uh i think pop tarts had something to do with it yes yeah yes do you remember that i have two of them left oh wow <laughs> yeah you can't have it it's, no it's okay it's, it's okay <laughs> there, there's some, yeah uh pop tarts came to us to do that promotion and i remember there was this really cool guy from pop tarts he's the product manager and we're sitting in this meeting. He said, we want to do a Freaky Stories promotion with you. And I, yeah, that's great. We, we like that. That's good. And um, and um, I, I said, I have one question for you. And he says, yes. And I said, you realize it's a cockroach and a maggot selling your food product. He says, yeah, we're cool with that. I said, bingo. My man. So, uh, <laughs> so I'm still eating Pop-Tarts. No, no, no. Uh, they paid for <laughs> shirts and basically if you phoned in when you saw something uh they take your name they would send you a t-shirt and i had a whole box of them here at the house and i remember neighbors would come by oh hey steve um you would have to have an adult <laughs> large <team." laughs> some guy you've never <laughs> seen before it's like hey you no no no, no. They, they were they were neighbors people i knew would you have it in adult large? So <laughs> really, really cool. And so the little girl wins. You know, they said th the prize was a guest appearance on Freaky Stories. Right. And we couldn't have her in an animated because the lead time to do that, we couldn't make her a character. So she had to be in the set, but we no longer had the live action um the diner the full, said, yeah. yeah that was in storage or it it hadn't been trashed at that point but it was in storage so i think i came up with the idea of send us our her school photo and that's why you see the photo of the little girl mm -hmm. and i think on instagram if you look up freaky stories on instagram there's a picture of her and her family on the set that day we we invited them down They'd never been on airplanes. They were some way up north. Never been on airplanes. We put them up in a hotel. And they came down to the set, like a million pictures and all this. It was so nice. It was really, really nice. So, uh, yeah. That's awesome. Because, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like the when we were watching season two, I was like, who's that little girl? Who is that? Is that someone from like That's the staff or something? But yeah. Season three. Yeah, yeah. And we also had. Uh, like bleachers set up very rarely were they used mm -hmm. but if he dropped by to see it wasn't like we were doing a whole show we we're doing this scene this scene and technical restarts and all you know so but um if there was a child somebody would bring their kid then you'd hear everyone going ca 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 and that was child alert which means all the profanity has to stop no yeah <laughs> and it, like John and I were talking that we should have had a documentary crew just following us around because it was it was insane. It was I would so love much to fun. see that. <laughs> I know there was also a couple of stories had recurring characters. I know one of them was the traveling salesman Joe. And did he come from yeah. somewhere? And did you have any more ideas for him? Oh, yeah, that, that was called The Suspect. The first story was called The Suspect. Uh, so I wrote that one, and that was based on an urban legend of the killer in the back seat. Yeah. Um, John and I had a big fight. Do you remember the one where the guy is in the future and he wakes up attached to the Sony? Um, it's just his head in a jar dude. or something like that? Yeah. Yeah. Sony light poor thing wrote the first story john looks at it and says steve that is sex drugs and rock and roll <laughs> says, you're right he says you can't do that on a kid's show it will not get on the air right before we even sent it to ytv he said you can't 
So I redid it and we set it in the future. And instead of the sex, it's just dancing. Instead of the drugs, the rock and roll was opera music and the drugs were this hypnotic thing where the, the eyes turn to numbers. Originally, the eyes turn to spirals. And, you know, and then um, John wouldn't let me do that. So I said, okay, they're numbers. And he accepted that. <laughs> and then we had a huge fight. I don't think I've ever seen John that angry at me. But at the end, where we've cut off his head, he says, you killed him. <laughs> I said, I, I killed him. He says, this is a kid's show. I said, yes, but I have to kill him to add consequences to the stories. If he doesn't, you know, he's using women and he's going to pay, right? So I either have to castrate him or kill him, mm -hmm. right? Choice. Um, but he has to pay. And there have to be consequences because otherwise none of the stories, this was season one, none of the stories will have consequences. And he said, you're right. And so we fought it. We got it on the air. YTV was not happy, but nobody ever complained. Mm -hmm. So that's when we had the suspect, we did the first one. And the, the suspect, I remember one of the sales guys said, if we had a TV series of this, I could sell this in Germany. We'd make a fortune. This would be huge. So the next year I did the next one with the vanishing hitchhiker, which, okay. And by that point I had done enough thematic analysis and Joe, the traveling salesman mm -hmm. is an actor who has problems with women. If you look at it from that point of view, mm -hmm. he is a complete asshole, right? That's what I was writing. He's an anti-hero. He's an asshole. Uh, he's picking up these girls, you know, um, yeah, th that was the intent. And then in the third one, where the girl pulls the gun on him, this was the only time that YTV ever censored. Oh, was so angry! <laughs> At the end, when she, you know, he she jumps out of the car, and he skids to a stop, and he comes back, um, and she, when she fell out of the car, she hit a. Um, uh, a light stand, right? Mm -hmm. And Joe says, something told me she wasn't going to bother anyone anymore, right? Mm -hmm. The original line was, something told me she wasn't that pretty anymore. Ooh. Right. <laughs> and, and I remember there was this person at YTV who was screaming that he's objectifying women. I said, He's been doing that for three episodes. <laughs> He's not a He's good not guy. A nice guy. He's not a good guy. Right. But we took him as far as we could. And there was Murray. Uh, Murray. Murray the Moocher. Murray the Moocher. That was Simon. Simon wrote those. Um, Simon all over that one. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Murray the Moocher. Murray came up a, a couple times. Yeah. There, there were people. Um, who we liked and we really brought back. But with the suspect, when Freaky ended, I wanted to make a feature. So I wrote this epic, epic, epic science fiction thing. Basically, him cleaned up. He's no longer abusing women. Uh, he's a private detective on steroids. Yeah. Like the whole thing on steroids. He's got his robot sidekick. Um, and they are... It's like the, there's uh, an Elon Musk type character with an atomic bomb and they've got flying wings and it's really, really, really super cool. And I took all the money that I made on Freaky Stories. I had animation cells painted up and I was just, they were costing me like 50 bucks a pop. I was giving them away like popcorn went down to LA to pitch this thing. Oh my God. I spent so much money on that thing. Nothing happens. And then, you know, shelved it. A few years later, uh, I'm at Fan Expo. Yeah. And there's a guy in line and I had been writing on this other show and he had been writing on this other show. We're sort of 
competing for scripts, so we weren't friends. Mm -hmm. But the show had ended. And he's a hell of a nice guy. So we're chatting. He says, yeah, he wants to do a science fiction thing. Do you have a science fiction thing? You know, I, I said, yeah. Or I said, I've got a science fiction thing. He says, can I see it? I said, yeah, sure. I sent it to him. He says, I see this as a TV series. Why don't we go partners on this? So we developed this thing together called, the character's name was Ravenshoe. So the show is called Ravenshoe. And it is so smart badass and everything and we had proposed remember um oh my god uh antonio banderas that black and white uh detective thing uh sin city yeah okay so we were going to film it like sin city you know what with models and all this stuff and we wrote the outlines for two seasons worth We've written probably three scripts, three hour long scripts, and then we've adapted them into half hours. And it's it's probably the smartest thing going on, but no. We we both shelved it. Mm -hmm. Was yeah. was there like just because you had other things to do, or there was no interest? I see. Yeah, there's no interest. It's like. Meh. Mm -hmm. You know, and we, we've sent it out to some people who would have the power to green light it. And they're like, nah, it's not that great. <laughs> so, but that's yeah. awesome. That's like, just all of that came from Joe from Freaky Stories. Just, yeah, yeah, that's yeah, yeah. Wild. I, no, I, no, just, it costs a lot of money. Mm -hmm, <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, you know, even but, if it didn't go anywhere, just hearing that story is just like, wow, wow, that's insane. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it was really, really cool mm -hmm. and uh, yeah and to this day you haven't seen anything like this i would love totally to see like you like upload if if you if you ever wanted to if you ever felt crazy enough to do it just like put that out there like upload like here's some I ideas I had. the other thing that was crazy about that is i put together a lookbook and the book is about this thick mm -hmm. of pictures and science fiction references and old zeppelins and, and stuff and robots and this is what it's going to be like and uh we've shown the book to people and said could i keep that book no you can't <laughs> nice try <laughs> yeah you cannot have that it's this incredible book. i yeah. see yeah so yeah so basically freaky ended mm -hmm. that project sort of came and went i was writing on other shows for a number of years afterwards, each year declining income. Mm -hmm. And then at a certain point I said, why am I doing this? You know, uh, yeah. Yeah, after all your dreams have come true and you're working on somebody else's show and it's not as good as your show. It's like, yeah, do I, do I want to work on the Smurfs? Do I want to work on my little pony or what? No. Yeah. No. Yeah. So I hung it up. Well, that's inter well, interesting how you say, like, you just made all your... That's, it's cool how you made your dreams a reality and did all the stuff that you wanted to do. Maybe not absolutely everything, but you got, like, the big the big things out of the way, and it's just really cool to see. Oh, no, I, I, have, I have done... Well, I, I have a list of things that I want to do, yeah. but I know that realistically there aren't enough years, mm -hmm. like, enough years left to do it, so... Um, you know, things you're not going to see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's been cool yeah. to just hear but, about them at the very least. <laughs> and I, I, I lived happily ever after. We got into a nice house. We're, you know, we've been here. Freaky got us into the house. Nice. And, um, you know, we're never moving. And uh, every day I have a good time. You know. Yeah. I, that, that'd be a you pretty know, good but, existence. <laughs> you know about you know about the giant puppets. What giant puppets? Ooh. You haven't been paying attention, my good man. So, uh, I, I'm into puppets. I, I go into schools. I do puppet workshops with kids. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Okay. My underlying philosophy with puppets, which was my underlying philosophy with animation, animation sucks. My stuff doesn't suck. So, I fell in love with 
Are you familiar with the giant puppets in Europe? No. Look up Royal Deluxe at some point. Royal Deluxe puppets or La Machine puppets. You're going to, your mind will explode. I've just sent you off on a whole other adventure. Nice. So these things cost about 45 million bucks a pop. Mm -hmm. And they are about 60 feet tall and they are incredible. So 2017, they were in Montreal and we went to Montreal. It's my birthday and got to see the giant puppets. And I'm standing there in the street with like 70,000 other people. And I said to my wife, I would like one of those, please. And she goes, ha ha, not going to happen. <laughs> so it happens and uh, I'm locked away. And I said, remember those giant puppets? She says, no. I said, yep. Yeah. So I started to work and I have a 16 foot tall, you know, the iron giant, you know, the kid. And he's yeah, got yeah. his, I've got a giant friend. He's 16 feet tall. He's Charlie Chaplin. He's in storage right now. I've seen but, the head. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's what that's that the is. Head. It's the full uh, animatronic. I've got the whole body. When you stand beside it and it walks, it's the it's like standing beside a T-Rex. And this thing with these huge feet. And it just walks. And it's, it's like a scale human being. But the intention is, what if in 1925, Charlie Chaplin commissioned a giant puppet to promote modern times. Mm -hmm. What would it have been like? So I have realized what that puppet would be. <laughs> and you know something? Mm -hmm. When I was standing on the street in 2017 thinking, that must be so cool to own that, right? It is. I can tell <laughs> you, it is that cool to own that. So now I'm building his dog. No kidding. <laughs> yeah. And I'm stopping... I'm stopping at the two puppets. <laughs> That's yeah. crazy, man. But I've, got, I've got other things to do. Mm -hmm. I was about to say, because I also saw that you held the world record for making the largest googly eyes in the world. Yes, I did. What drove you to do that? <laughs> oh, well, quite simple. There used to be a couple stores in Toronto called Active Surplus. Mm -hmm. They were junk stores. You know, you go in, they have junk, they have crap, they have all this industrial stuff, you could go in and get a prototype, some old brass prototype of a stone slinging machine. I don't know, they, they had everything. So there was one not far from me and I would go in two or three times a week. And for six months or a year, they had these huge domes, big plastic domes, like this thick clear, you know, with these bezels around the edges. Mm -hmm. Every time I'd be in there, I'd say, that looks like something that looks useful, but what? <laughs> and one day I'm in the shower, you know, I was sort of scrubbing. <laughs> I said, Those could make giant googly eyes, right? So I jump <laughs> out of the shower, jump in the car, right? Zip across town, go into the store. And there's another guy who is coming for the two domes, right? And I said, Mine, thank you. <laughs> go pay for come back home. So I started engineering <laughs> these googly eyes and I'm talking about them. One night at, there's a family dinner. My brother-in-law says, are they the biggest in the world? I said, I have no idea. He said, why don't you look? I said, I think I shall. So I looked them up. There is no googly eye thing on the Guinness site. So I write to Guinness. I said, I say, my good man, what are the requirements to set a Guinness world? And they write back and there's like I built the googly eyes at that point. And they said, they sent me 17 pages of you've got to do this and it's got to be televised on, you know, on TV and there's got to be uh, a, a surveyor has to measure them with a laser thing and to this degree of accuracy, blah, 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 blah. And if you fill it out wrong, then uh, we throw the whole thing in the trash. We don't even bother to tell you. <laughs> and it'll take six months at least, or you can pay $7,000. We'll come on the day. And I said, I'll, I'll take six months. Mm -hmm. So we had a thing. And six months later, I have a certificate for the Guinness. You know, I wasn't on the uh, 
in the book or anything, but I was on the website for four years. Wow. And then these guys come along and they beat it mm -hmm. uh, by like a foot or something for each eye. And then uh, recently somebody beat them. And I think each eye is 12 feet across. Each of my eyes was two feet across, mm -hmm. you know, which is not big, but hey, so all you need to do is win the record, set the record. Yeah, you did it. So, so yeah, so uh, I did that. Uh, I sent, I'm the first person to send a model of Star Trek's USS Enterprise to space. Wow. By helium balloon. Now, there was some guys who sent us uh a u.s enterprise with kirk taped to one engine and picard taped to the other they sent that into space a year before me but it looks like shit. mine looks hmm. like uss you can find that on uh on youtube uss enterprise in space cool yeah uh that is probably the most stupid and frightening thing i have ever done in my life Mm -hmm. Do not ever send anything into space. Right. <laughs> if you have that idea, do not do it. Because you are liable, right? If a battery falls out at a hundred thousand feet Ooh. and hits a vehicle on the four hundred mm -hmm. or on the one and you cause a fifty car accident, you, sir, are liable. And the guys at uh, Ministry of Transport, because I'm a good citizen, I contacted the Ministry of Transport and said, I plan to do this and this and this. And they said, please don't. And we said, because you are liable. I said, I will be careful. <laughs> so then I release it. Now, here is the thing. Remember I talked about earlier how I failed every other subject but English? Yep. Okay. I have a singular inability to do math. Mm-hmm. So there was this website that says, if you launch a balloon from point A, it will land at point B due to the wind conditions. So I kept checking that. Thing. Okay. It's yeah. going to go this way. Okay. I checked it on the morning we launched. We have GPS trackers and all this stuff. I launched the balloon and it goes not here. It goes here, <laughs> right? Very close to the American border near Sarnia. Now, if it goes into American airspace, the nice man at the Department of Transport said, I am a guest of Homeland Security. <laughs> I mean, so much. So, the thing, right, we release it. It goes into the air immediately. It's going in the wrong direction. If I had a shotgun, I would have blasted it out of the sky. <laughs> but within a minute, it's out of sight. And we're following it on the tracker. And I had borrowed the tracking rigs and the camera rigs from some guy in the U.S. He gave me all the balloons and everything, all the stuff. So I have $2,000 worth of his equipment. Mm -hmm. And if I lose it, you know, so we track it. It's going into the North Woods, you know, where no human has ever been. And Heather and I are in the car. And we're going up to, like, we're, we're just chasing this thing. We stopped. We bought hip waders. We bought bear repellent because I have to get this stuff back. Finally, it goes up so high that we lose the GPS signal, right? Yeah. Uh -oh. It could have been out of range for an hour. Five hours later, we pick up the signal, and it has crash-landed on a rock in Georgian Bay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the tracker is going to be good for another 24 hours. So I've got to get it off the rock. This is early April. Georgian Bay is pretty cold. I called the OPP. Since you have a boat out on, you know, they said, we don't have any boats on the water, right? I called a um, a yacht club, the Honey Harbor Yacht Club. Do you have a water taxi? Yes. So I give them the coordinates. It's going to cost me 200 bucks mm -hmm. versus 2,000 bucks. It's a bargain. Oh, yeah. So. Now, when we released the thing, there was a screamer on board. There's a siren. It's this god awful scream. It goes, ah, <laughs> you know, yeah. you can hear it. If it's in the tree, you can, it's in that tree over there. Okay. So they call me back. They say, yeah, we got it. We found it. Okay. It's here. I said, I will be up tomorrow. And they said, great. So I drive up to Honey Harbor and all this. I get out of the car and I hear my screamer. Mm -hmm. 
I follow the screamer to the office. Right. And there it is. Here's like four guys working in an office with this siren going like that. Right? And I walk over to it. I pulled the cord. I said, why didn't you shut it off? They said, we didn't know what it would do if you pulled the cord. In. I said, it would shut it off. So I paid them the 200 bucks and I left. Huh. And I took my camera back. I sent the cameras back to the guy down in Arizona. And, uh, and that was that. <laughs> Not bad. But the thing is, the thing is that the second that thing left my hand and it was going in the wrong direction, it was an, oh my God, what have I done? Mm -hmm. This is going in the wrong direction. And if it crashes somewhere, if it takes somebody out, I am liable. And that, I've never been in that position before. Everything has always been a movie. Everything has always been, you know, fun and games. But this was, I have released something into the world that can kill an innocent person. Mm -hmm. so what have I unleashed? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and sitting here now, right. I remember the terror. You don't feel the terror, but it's like, oh no, yeah, I am responsible. You know, I am responsible for this. Yeah. And that is a strange feeling. That's crazy, but I'm glad it worked out for you in the end. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're still we're, so, we're here talking about it, laughing about it. So <laughs> yeah, nobody too, died. Yeah, no one died. That's the most important thing. Uh, let's see. So we're coming near the end. Just a couple extra various things here. Uh, there was also so I know there's the Freaky Stories had a thing at the AGO exhibit, and yes, yeah, there is something yeah. really interesting about that, like a story from my life, sorta, kinda. But okay, go ahead. Uh, there was a D Darren Jones. He host. He he was there. He was doing the whole event there. Yeah. And lo long story short, my my mother used to work at the uh, bartending school of Ontario. If you remember that place yeah. at all, yeah. And uh, she got featured on the Rick Mercer report. And Darren Jones interviewed her. And I recorded that. And I was like, wait a minute, that's the same guy from this thing. And it, it was just kind of wild to see. It was like, wow, that that's <laughs> that's crazy. But okay, Rick Mercer report. Look at the one where he's talking about zombies. Mm -hmm. Okay. And there's footage where he goes to a zombie walk. And in the background, you will see this giant 12 foot zombie. That's me. Really? So, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so what happened was when I was in Nelvana, after I was taken off magic school bus, and the, they did this every year, you know, you, they each season there would be a new producer so i did producer one so i'm floating around the studio for the next three years with a cup of coffee until freaky stories went into production long story mm -hmm. so i really had nothing to do one march break uh they said to me oh steve we're doing a march break thing at uh, ago grab some artists grab some desks get over to the ago set up a mini studio and we're gonna show them how animation stuff i said okay good so I did that and hung out at the AGO, talking with the AGO people for a week, which was great. Yeah. And then the next year, did it again. Excuse me. And then Freaky goes into production. And I'm still friends with the AGO people. They're nice people. Mm -hmm. And then it was second year. It's like March break. And I thought, and uh, yeah, second year, it's March break. There's a better AGO story. But anyhow, <laughs> uh, and I went to my friends at the AGO and I said, uh, hey, you know, can, we, can I bring my show into the AGO? And they said, yeah. So we set it up. You know, uh, Deco gave me some money to do it. The AGO gave us some money. We set it up. We did the whole show. We set the, at the time, the all-time one-day attendance record. The, the place was just packed with kids and they were not happy, right? But we got a nice thank you letter. <laughs> and uh, so that's on my resume. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's pretty cool. Breaking records all over the place. Very, very, very cool. And my wife brought the kids down and it's like, my daddy made that. My daddy made that, you know. Yeah. Michael's going, Jim did that. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> and we, we had the, uh, the diner in a display case and these guys were uh were all in their display cases and people were duly impressed 
That's pretty cool. Yeah, I'm glad someone got some footage of that because seeing that for the first time recently, I was like, wow, look at this. This is so cool to see. Just them all in action, just all that. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> Did you see the one? There's a French one uh, from Canal Plus uh, where it's freaky stories and we're being interviewed in English but it's translated into French and it's actual behind the scenes footage of me with hair and uh, John never had hair <laughs> and uh, it, it's behind the scenes uh, probably season two season one season two you think that it got uploaded to YouTube it's on YouTube oh, okay yeah yeah but the, there's a few freaky stories documentaries that one's really interesting uh, I did not know I could speak French. <laughs> you learn cool. something new every day. Yeah. And, but, but really, you know, to sum it all up, like we were in France last year visiting the home of the giant puppets. Yeah. Right? This is awesome. If you ever get to Nantes, it's the island of the machines. So look those guys up. Um, and I wrote to them like a week, two weeks before we went and said, hey, you know, I, I built this giant puppet. And we're going to be there, and can we stop in and say hello? Yeah. And they very nicely wrote back, and they said, yes, on the day you arrive, please come to the information desk and let us know you're here. What day are you coming? We told them, we'll be there on Tuesday. So we show up and at 11 o'clock, the appointed time, whatever. We go over to the desk. The guy comes out and goes, hello, I am Nicholas. I am the head of the... And we sort of figure it's going to be five minutes it's going to take us in he's going to say this is the wood shop you no know, here this is a mechanical shop blah 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 and then we're out the door and i'll be very very grateful for it. he says this is the wood shop this is the mechanical shop and we're sort of edging to the door he says do you have any questions i said yeah i've got a few questions and i've got like this book full of questions yeah and i said do you have two of everything? Because we're wondering how you ship things around the world. And he says, these cost 30 million euros each, $45 million. Um, so no, we do not have duplicates. I said, then how do you, you know, and I started asking these technical questions and his English is excellent. So the five minutes turns into an hour, mm -hmm. right? And he says, come over here. This is the secret stuff. Please don't photograph it, right? And he's showing us incredible stuff it's like oh, my mind is blowing up right and this is great this is great this is great and then at the end of it he says what is your background you know because we're talking technical stuff about the puppet robotic control systems he says what's your background i said well i was in animation and inspector gadget magic school bus and I said, and freaky stories, freaky stories. I go, frisons in French. And I pull out a picture on my phone of Larry Maurice. He mm -hmm. goes, you did that. I, go, <laughs> I did that. He says, my childhood. Thank you for my childhood. Whoa. And I, I said, that's what everyone says. That's and crazy. I said, we did it. I said, I did it for you. Yeah. Right. He says, yes, I know. Right. Speaking of like when you were talking about how freaky stories the guy in france was talking about it uh do you know uh how the show was treated or received in other parts of the world every everyone that i hear from all over the world likes it mm -hmm. you know, it was incredibly hard sell you know the um the salesman the decode they didn't get it you know it was difficult to sell or they said it was difficult to sell and what I said all along, I am not into baseball. I'm not a sports guy. My brother-in-law loves baseball. You know, he, he could he could convince me to go to a baseball game, which is crazy. <laughs> but he said, I'm the last person you want to have talking about baseball, but he is the right person to talk about baseball, right? I said, so why don't you bring me to meet the people? And he said, no, we can't bring you. I said, why not? You know, you've got nothing to lose. You're not selling it anyhow. Mm -hmm. It was like, oh, you know, so that's why the third season was short. We did nine episodes instead of uh, 13. Mm -hmm. And they said, we'll only finance nine. So 
that was that. I wrote the entire last episode. That's the one with uh, uh, the lodger, you know, the, the Christmas yeah, one. That one. I've heard yeah. you say that one was like your favorite. And then I was like, okay, I got some expectations. Like, wow, that was really good. <laughs> that might be yeah, the yeah. best well, freaky what, story. It, it was the best. I, the, the first one that I wrote was Mixed Nuts. Mm -hmm. And the last one was The Lodger. I think those are the best. Uh, but The Lodger, what happened is I wrote the whole thing. And then uh, this is, he ends, this is a true story. And I wrote the end. And then, the, like the night before we recorded it, I had this inspiration for that whole thing where uh, Santa's locked in the, the thing. I just wrote it to bang because I've been writing the lodger for weeks because it's poetry. Yeah. And then that last part where uh, Santa's in the sleigh, Merry Christmas to all and to all a good night. Ha ha ha. Right. That was like 10 minutes of inspiration. And I stuffed it into the fax machine to YTV and I said, approve this. Don't question it. Just <laughs> approve it. And got the approval. We went into the recording studio. Uh, the script was longer than usual. We actually had a metronome going so that the actor, Maurice Dean Wint, right? Yeah. And he's like hitting the metronome, everything, everything, everything. And uh, it it came out, it was like wonderful like that. Fantastic, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I also, the guys in Ottawa, the episode before that, I said, guys, slack off. You know, just take it easy. Do the minimum amount of work, okay? Just take it easy. Yeah. Right? Because the last one, I need you guys to be your best, right? Mm -hmm. And they did it, you know. Yeah. I say they did. Yeah, you guys all did an amazing job. And just the way the voice actor, like, again, I also want to say that Freaky Stories might have, like, one of the craziest ensembles of just Torontonian voice talents in there. Because They you're... weren't Torontonians. They weren't Torontonians. Oh, wait, the they voice actors. All... Yeah, they were Shakespearean actors from Stratford. Yeah, yeah. Like, a lot of those guys. Yeah. Like, I've, I, I mean, I've heard them in, like, various things. It's like, wait a minute. I've heard this guy in Babar. I've heard this guy in this anime. Yeah. And all these things. It's like, you got everybody in here. But Well, what would happen is... There would be four actors, four stories. We record them all in the morning. And all the guys from Stratford would pile in a car. They'd drive down to the studio. They'd each record their thing, drive back. So it was, it was these, with very few exceptions, they were really, really high caliber actors. The one with the grape juice was there was a, a lady... I don't know if she was a secretary, but she worked at YTV. And that was her real voice. Really? It wasn't she? The squeaky little voice. Uh, yeah. And uh, she's, she, we keep in touch. She's a nurse with Doctors Without Borders. You wow. know, and she's like in Africa. And she's an Ebola nurse. And like she, she goes into the most uh, life-threatening situations to save lives. And... And I told her that, you know, she is just the most inspiring. And she's tiny. She's this tiny little person. And she, the bravest human being I've ever met. Because she, she risks her life every day to help other people. That's crazy. Yeah. And she just yeah. did this little thing on Freaky Stories. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I always said I had to have her. You know, awesome. and it'd be the odd one who would come in. But... Mm-hmm. And like, uh, like I, I, I remember uh, Wayne Robson. I've heard his voice. I was like, wait a minute, that's the guy from Red Green. Uh, there's Jane Eastwood in there. Blah blah blah. Just yeah, you guys. And you, were you there in the booth with a lot of them? I, I was there all. In most cases, there was one episode. This is the one with the golden statue that comes to life. Yeah. Okay. So that was actually my final project at Sheridan College 20 years before, which I never finished. They, they let me graduate any of them. Yeah. Uh, but I never finished it. And then in Freaky Stories, I said, I've got to finish that. So I wrote the story. And for some reason, I couldn't be in the booth. We had cast the actress. 
And she shows up on the day. So yeah, I'm getting congested. I've got a bit of a cold. So and she has the worst, the worst head cold you've ever heard. Right? Yeah. And and the casting director who was direct, you know, casting lady, I said, Joanne, you record that thing. You know, she didn't phone me and tell me that this woman was sick as a dog. And it came through that she was sick as a dog. And I said, why didn't you tell me? She said, well, she needed the money. I said, I don't care that she, we would have had her in a different story. Mm -hmm. But but you compromised one of the stories. Yeah. You know, like you shouldn't have done that. Yeah. Because there's no reason for her to have this terrible head cold in the story. If it's part of the character, great. But otherwise. Yeah, yeah. not great. <laughs> so that was that was the only one that I can recall that I wasn't there interesting but yeah like just amazing amazing talent all around and just you got to be there for all of it heavily involved in all that stuff it's it's amazing i might we might have skimmed over this a little bit earlier but uh were there any other stories you wanted to cover with future seasons or what direction did you envision for the show if it kept going we would have kept going we, we could have easily have kept going but the fact that we ended it and I put my personal stamp. Um, like when I was a kid making TV commercials, I said that the last commercial I would ever make would be a tampon commercial. <laughs> because then it's time to leave. And coincidentally, the last commercial that came through was my first and last tampon commercial. <laughs> so time to leave. And I always said that my last freaky story would be a Christmas story, right? So when we knew it was going to end, you know, I knew that there was going to be a Christmas story. And that was it. So that was the end of it. And, you know, were there other stories? There could have been other stories. But what happens is when you're writing them, when you're in the midst of all this, the creative juices are really flowing. So it's easy. Like Simon always said that the hardest thing was um the concepts for the stories like he didn't want to use up good ideas and i never had a problem with the ideas they just there were there were too many of them we had books of things that we never got to uh would i want to do it again no you know like i i think two or three times a year Somebody will say, hey, Steve, I got this idea. Why don't we do a revamp of freaky stories? Wow. I mean, you know, it's like, that's your brilliant idea is you want to rip off my 25-year-old project. Mm -hmm. That's the best thought, right? And the thing is that if you look at Canada, you'll, you'll always see there'll be the new kids in the hall. Uh, it's their 45th anniversary special, right? You know, and... and these old men come out and they did the thing that they did 40 years ago. Right. Right. Or it's uh, the remake of, uh, Anne of green Gables. Here's Anne of green Gables and her flying cat. You know, it's like, and, and people are rehashing all this stuff mm -hmm. they did 40 years ago. And like, and I, I know this guy who won an Oscar about 40 years ago for best animated short subject. And he's been chasing that for the past 40 years. Well, I won the Oscar. I, I can do it again. I can do I'm an Oscar winner. Mm -hmm. It was 40 years ago. I'm an, or I, I was big on Canadian TV 40 years ago. And like, yeah, I, I was big. It was 25 years ago. Great. You know, I had a good time. I left. Mm -hmm. Right. I don't want to go back. I don't want that to be the high point of my life. Yeah. You know, it was yeah. great. But, uh, I look forward to my next adventures, which are going to be equally as great and less frustrating. Yeah, you know? I can imagine. <laughs> yeah, I, like, I, I think it's very sad. That's that's what people, you know. Yeah, it's 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 the reunion tour. No, yeah, you know, uh, for me, Simon is no longer with us. Ted is no longer with us. Barney, the cameraman, isn't with us. I'm in touch with a lot of people. Uh, we have a good time when we get together. Um, but no, 
no, you know, it was from its time period. Yeah. You know, I was, my kids were young. They enjoyed it. Uh, to go back, it wouldn't be the same. It makes so. sense. I like when I was a kid and I used to hear people talk about, would I do this again? No, I, I wouldn't understand it because I was a kid, but now I understand, like, there are some people who are like, I would feel okay about this, but I understand people who are like, nah, that was just me. That was a, that was a product of its time. This is where my mind space was. I want to do other things. And I get it for everyone. Like, it's all valid. And I understand, like, all walks of life and just where they're coming from. And yeah, that, I understand yeah. where it's like, yeah, I don't just want to sit on my laurels. I want to do other things with maybe the same spirit and, like, passion i had for this other project i did but i want to you know spread my wings a little bit flex my muscles here's what else i can do i mean freaky was on the screen what i'm doing now uh with the giant puppets mm -hmm. the inspiration for that like i was three or four years old my mom took us to the royal ontario museum i remember sitting in my stroller and there's a display case with this giant rock, these three huge dinosaur footprints in it, right? Now, reality, the rock's probably this big, and the footprints are like that. So I've gone back many times, and I cannot find the rock or the footprints. But yeah. I remember being three years old going, holy cow, a dinosaur was just right here, right? And I picture there's going to be a little kid in his stroller and this giant puppet is going to come walking by, and I specifically engineered it to look down and smile and wink. So that little boy or a little girl will grow up and talk about this giant robot that they saw that smiled at them. And they'll remember it for 60 years and talk about it in 60 years' time. And that's immortality. Yeah. That's yeah. that's really... that's There's something so pure about that. Right. Yeah. I yeah. would say you're a pure soul, my good man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you're crazy, but correct. you're pure. <laughs> oh, please, lose it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I wanted to know, like, uh, just about, because you did uh, the sound effects for Inspector Gadget. Can you really quickly tell me, like, some of the cool, like, how you how you personally did some of the sounds on that show? And... Most of them were from a sound effects library. Ah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we, we would just go to the library, record some stuff. Um, occasionally, we'd come in on a Sunday, bringing in pots and pans and stuff and performing our own sound effects. Once or twice, we did Foley type stuff, which was incredible. You know, if you're ever looking for a, a livelihood, Foley is super cool, mm -hmm. right? A Foley artist. Um, it was great. We had such a good time. Um, like we were, we were working at King and Spadina on the fourth floor of this building, 409 King West. It was a film building. Everything was film businesses in there. Mm -hmm. And we had these sound effects. We had these giant Boston acoustic speakers. And we would go out for lunch <laughs> and we'd put on a tape loop of sound effects and just open the windows and aim the speakers out into the street and they'd echo everywhere. And this company had did, done the sound effects for Ilsa Seeps, Ilsa She-Wolf of the SS, right? And yeah. there was a sound effects role called mm -hmm. of this woman. Oh, dear. And we would just... <laughs> I just oh, yes. got it. <laughs> and, yeah. <sighs> we would put it on and go out for supper. You know, and she'd be moaning in the streets. Or, yeah, that's that was us. Yeah. <laughs> so wait, that was that. That's in the show. Did you say? No, that's not in the show. That that was life in the studio. Oh, I see. You just messing yeah. around. <laughs> yeah, just, just, it was all about the messing around. Yeah, <laughs> we had so much fun. I, I mean, you're young. You're irresponsible. They're paying you very good money. So much and, power. <laughs> yeah and as long as we uh yeah th there was uh one episode uh oh what was her name amazon annie it was a two-parter and there's part where gadget is kicked out of the plane 
and he's pulling all these rip cords and trying to get the parachute and this gadget misfires and that gadget misfires and I, I spent so much time editing the sound effects in that when he hits the ground right I just went to the sound effects library and I found a sound effect of somebody taking a sledgehammer to a grand piano when so yeah so you've got this whole symphony <laughs> of sounds that, boom, that was fun uh there was one episode where don adams mm -hmm. did not record the line right whatever the inflection was wrong everything was wrong uh, they were paying Don about 3000 bucks an episode 40 years ago, which is a lot of money. Yeah. Right. And I wrote, I, I sent a note to the studio. I said, can you please get Don to re-record this line? You know, I got this snotty note back from some assistant saying, Mr. Adams is a professional. He does everything perfectly the first time. He will not be recording your line. So I went into the booth. I went, go, go, get. No kidding. <laughs> yeah. So there is one episode where I'm impersonating good Don Adams for I don't know which one it is, oh but it's me. Oh my gosh. Yeah. No way. You, you I can't assume I I don't assume you remember any specifics about that. No. Ah. Uh, but it's in no, there somewhere. It's in there. It, yeah, I recorded Don Adams for one line. Wow. Someone needs to put that on your uh behind the voice actors page. <laughs> That's crazy, because the only thing I see there is uh, some guy from Magic School Bus, like a photographer, I think. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah they, we were recording that episode, and they didn't have an actor for that. And the clients said to me, they said, Steve, get in the booth. Go, no, nah, 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 get in the booth. Okay. Thanks. Are you Mr. Frizzle? <laughs> uh, no, I, I'm Mr. Seedplot. All right, everyone say... Seed! You know, so I got in the booth, right? And I recorded my two lines. And now that I go into schools and do workshops, that gives me incredible credibility with the kids that I not only produce that season, but I'm a character in Magic School Bus. So, mm -hmm. And it was funny because Larry, who became Larry the Bug, who was directing, we were actually having lunch a few weeks ago, and I was talking about that. And I said, did you ever... Uh, you ever get in the booth? Larry had been working for 45 years. He says, I never did. But we've been asking our friends. Nobody ever thought to get into the booth. <laughs> right. And I even put it out. There was, there's an animation page on Facebook. And I said, did anyone get the booth? Nobody ever got in the booth. So, and I would have never thought of it. It was just, Steve, get in the booth. I got in the booth. I think some of the most underrated performances in animation come from guys who work on the show and they're like, well, no one else is going to do this. So I'm going to get in there and do it. And then like nine times out of 10, they're usually that character. Everyone remembers. It's like, oh yeah, this guy was played by like the sound designer or the editor, but he is really, really good. <laughs> yeah, that, that's the way it works. Um, but uh, I find it strange that none of my contemporaries ever did that. It's like, okay. Well, it yeah. just makes you unique, even more unique. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Add so another thing to the unique thing. <laughs> yeah. But the other thing that Larry said is he's worked on a lot of shows. He says, the only show that people remember is Magic School Bus, you know, in his entire career. And I, I said, well, people remember freaky stories from Magic School Bus and Gadget. I mean, I worked on a lot of stuff. Yeah, I worked on many shows, but you don't care about Rupert Bear. I kind of like Rupert. Rupert sucks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Counter argument. It's like, oh crap, yeah. he does care. That sucks. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Dog City. No, Dog City. I love but, Dog. Uh, Did you work on Dog City? I was on the Midnight Breakdown Sound Analysis Crew, uh -huh. which you know they they record the voices, they edit them together. And then you have to chart them onto exposure sheets so the animation syncs up. That's how they do it. Yeah. So there, there were guys, there was a crew. We'd go in at 6 o'clock every night. 
and they give us 500 feet and you just charted it on exposure sheets and you had to be accurate. Um, and I was very, very fast. So I would probably do about a thousand feet a night. And for many years that fed my family. Wow. Yeah. Dog city rocks, man. I was, I just made a video about it not too long ago and I was trying to find people who worked on it. And, uh, Mike, oh, I know everybody. You, you, you knew everybody. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. I might as well, since we're here, uh, do you have any production stories on that? Any other things that you know well, about? I, I was I was in an editing room. There is a friend of mine on Facebook, John Van Bruggen. Write this down. Yes, John Van Bruggen. My God. I was trying to get... He directed it. Yeah. He directed it. Contact him through Facebook. I have been trying. When I made that, when I made my Dog City video, I was trying, because uh, Mike Zanyaska, do you know him? Do you have him on yeah, Facebook? Yeah. He's, he's he's the dad of one of my best friends since high school. We're, we're really close, too. Yeah. But I was like, can you get uh, John Van Bruggen to uh, speak with me about directing Dog City? And he was like, yeah, I'll, I'll see what I can do. But he never responded. I tried LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram. Uh, I even tried contacting his wife, Arna Selznick, about stuff, but oh, yeah. none of them ever responded to any of my messages. And I like to think I was very, very polite. So, because when I, when you messaged me, like, almost instantly about the Freaky Stories interview, I was like, I guess they just don't want to talk about Dog City or something, but... No, John's very proud of Dog City. Um, oh, oh, JVB, I'll... Yeah, do you I'll think you can hit him up? And say, yeah. hey, this, this kid has been trying to ask you yeah. about Dog yeah. City. Yeah. Dog City. And we had a good time together. All right. Please. Yeah. It, thanks so much. Because that, that yeah. would be so awesome. No, John, John, John's a good guy. And Arna Selznick, his wife, is fascinating. She is the second lady after Lottie Reininger in the 1920s to direct an animated film. She gets no credit for it. But historically, she is the second female film animated film director in history. Wow. <laughs> I need to speak to those guys, too. <laughs> yeah, they are, they are super cool. Uh, we, we never ran in the same circles at Nelvana. Nelvana was uh, highly, highly, highly political. Mm -hmm. And I was on the wrong side of a lot of things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there were people who they didn't like the color of my shoes, you know, whatever it was. Yeah. Yeah. So, and they went and they, they were always nice, but they were with a different crowd. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. But that, that's wild. I didn't think that the interview would uh, get that, but that would be awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Could... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, see, this is why. Yeah. Yeah. The clipboard. Why have words. Good, yeah. good stuff, man. Good stuff. Because, because otherwise it'll go, in one ear, out the other. Yeah. My goodness. Yeah. Uh, so let's see. Now we're coming down to the final final few questions here. Uh, what is your favorite food? <laughs> I have so many favorite foods. You know, what? I, mean, I make a wicked gumbo. I make a wicked hot and sour soup. My escarole soup is... Uh, is beyond reproach. I make the best plank salmon in the world. <laughs> we don't order salmon when we go out because why should we have second rate salmon? <laughs> um, I make a really good steak. Uh, yeah, and, yeah, stuff like that. Dang, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> yeah, ribs. My barbecue is superb. Well, wow, if I'm ever in the area. <laughs> My chicken and ribs. I will say, do you, do you ever do barbecue? Uh, Slow cook barbecue? Yeah, we do barbecue. Not me personally, okay. but the house, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I will send you Matt Allen's uh, barbecue spice recipe. Matt Allen is a childhood friend, became a rockabilly musician, and he travels to Texas on barbecue tours. And uh, he... He is my guru. So he gave me his spice mix. I use it on ribs. I use it on chicken. So I would, you just rub it on and it's magic. Nice. I'm looking Mad forward to that. <laughs> and, okay, next question. Okay, this is the final question. Uh, any questions you have for me? No pressure. Is there something you wanted to ask me? <laughs> 
Yeah. What's your background? Where'd you go to school? What do you want to be when you grow up? All right. So let's see. So uh, Jamaican Canadian background. I'm not going to go that far, but uh, okay. let's see. Uh, so I've just been doing so much with in terms of just art like that's always been my thing like I've always loved drawing like I posted that little freaky stories thing on uh the Facebook fan page that I just decided to do that for Inktober uh yeah drawing I want to make I'd like to see if I could make my own series one day uh when it when it came to animation college don't waste your time (laughs) that's what I've heard from some people yeah don't waste your time but what else did I do? I also went to uh, Mohawk for animation. And oh, yeah. Yeah, I met some really cool dudes. Like, I don't know if you know Scott Glynn. He was one of my teachers. For Scott, yeah. Yeah, Scott was awesome. He was like, he was really supportive when it came to my stuff because I already had a bit of a video editing and voiceover background. And when it came to like projects and things like that, it's like, edit like a one minute thing of you talking about this or uh, pilots or the storyboard and he would see my stuff and he was like dude what are you doing here you, you've already got like a pretty good grasp on a lot of stuff and people were calling me to do voiceovers for their uh thesis films or like end of, end of semester projects so i'd love to just i like doing art voice acting all that stuff i just like and all the videos on my youtube channel like i'm gonna try and put a lot of what we were talking about today in an eventual freaky stories video that i'm writing and yeah, I wanted to go the extra mile and speak with the creator because I'm my own my own breed of crazy. But yeah, aside from that, I think we've got all the questions we've got. But is there anything else you want to plug or like? Because there's no, f- no, not really. No, I'm not plugging anything. I'm I'm happy. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'll just say yeah. that there's this, the Freaky Stories Facebook fan page. That that's pretty cool. I I like that. <laughs> yeah, I, I haven't looked at it in the longest time. You know. It, it's like we used to agonize over all this stuff. It's like I don't, you know, uh, I, I love it. The thing that gives me the biggest thrill is when I come across somebody who's tattooed Larry Maurice or Larry or Maurice on their bodies. Uh-huh. It's like they're crazier than I am. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, and, and that's the mortality because obviously a young person they're going to grow up, they're going to have kids. They're gonna kids are gonna have kids. The grandchildren are gonna talk about grandpa's crazy tattoo on his right, tell their friends, and in 70, 80 years, they're gonna look up freaky stories on whatever the medium is going to be. And these guys are gonna dance again mm-hmm. in 70 80 years' time. That's great. So. Yeah. And I think, yeah, that's that's some that's an amazing note for uh yeah to just end on because that is it's so awesome like even though freaky stories might not have like the reach as say spongebob or whatever like take it from me there's a, a a lot of devoted fans out there who love what you guys did and i think it's gonna live forever i honestly think that it might sound crazy but i think it's gonna live forever in some way shape or form that's great yeah i'm hopeful it's funny i went through a, a bad period you know like uh postpartum depression after freaky ended and i was looking at a lot of photographs of um, forgotten vaudeville performers mm-hmm. it, and there was this one picture of the nate brothers and it's these four guys on stage and they look so bad you know they look they look so awful and i thought who are these guys you know they're what's their they're, story what's their story and they're forgotten and they're gone and they're dead and the only remembrance is this one stinking photo and i think freaky will be better than that (laughs) no doubt (laughs) and uh for the audience i'll just say thanks for listening to this uh, episode of up north and personal and uh we'll see you next time whenever that may be